All right, so shall I hit the broadcast? Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, ready? Yeah. All right, we're on. I don't actually know what we're talking about, but... Uh, it's just big word here, industrial, in the middle. Um, this was your idea, mate. Was it? Yeah. All oh, right. okay. Domestic, Oh, we've got loads industrial. more. We've got loads more to go. We've got surge protection one to do. We've got fire alarms. That's going to be a really controversial one. Mm. Um, Search protection will be good, and <clears throat> and then we've got to do we've got a DNO intakes one to do, so we've got at least three more, so we're only kind of halfway. And then after that, um, do we dare touch upon the whole diverted neutral current? We can do, we can do. It'd also be nice think... to do a little talk about what we do about things that are outside of BS seven six seven one, but within reach of the sounds like five two six yes. six and things, and and what actions we take with those you know observations. What? I could do a coding session on emergency lighting alone. I've got that many pictures of stupidity just mm-hmm. on way out signage alone. I've got some yeah. classics. All right, people are saying hello. Uh, so hi, Michael. Hi, Chris. David. Daniel Lodges. Andy. All right, it's good. If you're wondering, Paul Scum has grown a beard and developed the English <laughs> language. Um, no subtitles needed. After 12 months in <laughs> Portugal. No, I mean, we, we arranged to do this with Paul, but Paul has the past couple of weeks been saying I might be available, I might be available. Uh, and pretty much after, like, Neil getting fully involved last week in the in the commercial, uh, basically just popped the questions you fancy coming on with this one. And pretty yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Because, um, yeah, Paul, uh, Paul has been pre- he's pretty busy. But we will get in. We will corner him. And we'll put them on the internet. Well, we've still got to, we've still got to finish the um, the biblical extended Lord of the Rings podcasts on CE Mark, and we're only we're only so yeah. far into it. No, I watched I was watching one of our webinars the other night, and it was the point where we talked about you know CE marking, and then we talked about yeah. um, categories and things like that. You know, but it is it is what it is. He's a busy man. Yeah, I'm chasing on that actually. That's another one we got to get sorted. All right. In, uh, let's see what people are saying. Uh, Dave says, enough tech stuff to take us through to the end of the year, in <laughs> yeah. all fairness. Dave says, net currents and diverted neutrals. You've been teasing too much, Paul. That's the problem. I have Everyone been wants teasing to talk too much. Well. My brain, I've been scratching my bloody head trying to figure it out myself. Well, mm. we've kind of figured it out now. It's. <sighs> we'll see. Watch and stay to the end, and you may see something. Yes, we'll know. We've end already end. got an FI from Connor. <laughs> FI. Have we really? Yeah. I need to FI that FI, to be honest with you. That first I watched back the pulled. first one and I just, I cringed. I was just like, oh, halfway through, I was like, geez, I'm FIing everything. Stop it. And I was, I was trying to be too cautious. Yeah. Because I, I, this- again, I worked my way up from the FI into the C3, C2, C1s. My brain is wired a weird way. And then come the next week, everything was just boiling your piss, weren't it, mate? It Constant boil my piss. Some, someone's boiling it already. All right. Is, uh, is Paul, your uh, is your yeah. dad going to join us today, the C1 monster? I don't know. You know what? Um, I, he doesn't say he's coming on these things. He just appears, you know. Um, he might do. Yeah. I, chat, I, was, actually, I, was on, um, I was on Discord the other day, and he said, oh, I always do the C1s because then I'm putting myself to the position. I was like, you don't have to justify it. I know what you're doing. You're putting yourself in that position where you've got to do it. But he was like, oh, I was, I, was, I, was on, I was on the webinar with the guys last week and I was trying to type responses, but then Paul would go to the next thing. I was like, oh, fuck it. And I deleted that. And he's, he's, like, he's, a sl- he's one of these typists. You know, he's Sorry. one of those. Oh, he's one uh, of them. <laughs> so he's trying with to type responses under his nose. Yeah. I'm the same. About, by the time you've, uh, he's, got, he's about to submit, we're like three codes further along. <laughs> so. I'm surprised it's Sean in, because Sean's normally in this. No, he's not in. He's not in tonight. Okay. We're not well, I'll be the same with this one anyway. This one will go on YouTube as soon as it can get rendered and uploaded and all the rest of it. Although I will say this for the record, um, that YouTube does kind of, and, and just for clarity, because we've had lots of feedback and comments on the YouTube videos. So YouTube kind of removes 40 to 50% of the enjoyment of this because we are talking to the people who are watching and engaging. Mm. This is just a record video of the engagement we have with other electricians, engineers, inspectors, etc. So uh, apologies if this doesn't float all of your boat, but come on and do these live. There's plenty more to come. Yeah, yeah. from, uh, from someone, who, someone who, who, who done exactly that in the first one, I watched it on YouTube, um, and then the, the difference between being involved on the second one compared to watching the first one after the event was, uh, was night and day, it really was. Yes, mm. 
yeah, and, and we, these literally go on <clears> YouTube <throat> just as a record uh, um, because our view has always been if someone can take something away. And the fact is, if we don't thought, put them on, everyone will go, oh, I wish they were on YouTube. So yeah, it, kind of do, just, yeah. it just saves people asking for them to go on YouTube. But Neil's right. Um, and this is one of the things, the reasons that I started the webinars way back when COVID hit is unlike many webinars where you just sit and you hear and the questions get saved up until the end or they get a couple of them. Um, what we try to do is just bring everyone into this discussion as much it, as we what can. What are you saying, Dave? Are you saying you were the first person to do webinars during COVID? Oh, yeah, you were. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. And others just lecture, whereas I'm happy to be told, told I'm wrong. Um, but unfortunately, this is the problem. Unfortunately, it can drag. Yeah. Because we don't want to shut people up. And this is the thing. We've only got five hours um, scheduled for this one. So, no, this is the shortest of all of them. But hopefully this will be the most technically engaging. Um, and I think with Neil here as well, it will add a good dynamic. So thank you for coming on, Neil. Yeah, um, and for everyone watching their big screen, if you look at the bottom corner, we've had to emer uh, get an emergency intervention and replace Paul's logo with Neil's. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, the UKS Rail. You, you're the director of UKS Rail. Um, and you're also just this cute puppy rottweiler um <laughs> that people just want to hug and sometimes just slap a bit but hug occasionally i'm saying this live is that so through gritted teeth it was back. it paul no 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, right um hmm. dave um what mate cue the musical intervention bit and start well this is live there's no music you've got to edit that bit in your youtube bud just do it in your head. Yeah, dun, right. Dun, 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 dun. It's a, Let's it's go. Catchy music. Let's go. Right. Okay. Um, let me just move that bit of paper. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our third of our webinars. Um, this one's going to be, again, slightly different because unlike the domestic ones, which is a very, and I've said this all along, the domestic is full of lots of complexities, lots of challenges, lots of human factors and interfaces and social challenges and, and emotional uh, elements that come into um, the job that you shouldn't do, but it does. Um, commercial is very much financially and, and time constrained. Industrial is a, it really is a different kettle of fish. And, and that's why I kind of brought us Neil to come on as Paul's replacement. So thank you very much, Neil. Um, so what we'll do is my mouse ever works. Every time I do this, the mouse never works. Um, remind ourselves um, in the industrial game, is it fair to say, Neil, the average age of the industrial spark is a little bit, there's a lot of the seasoned veterans in the industrial game. Yeah, I'd say um, so. Mm. And for I those who, I definitely said that's, that's, that's where you get a lot of career sparks. I would career sp yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, yeah. T. Clarks of the world and stuff, mm -hmm. they, you know, time served, they spend their entire careers getting a pension and all the rest of it. Um, so again, a lot of the, a lot of the older chaps um, or ladies, uh, C1, C2, C3, C4 was the last time it was in uh, 16th edition amendment two caused a lot of conflict. I mean, Neil, what do you remember about this as you're one of our new uh, hosts today? Well, what I do remember, obviously I do remember them. So I'd done, I, I qualified in the yellow book on the 16th. That was when Same. I qualified. Um, so this was, and back then testing wasn't really uh, pushed like it is now. It was, I, I remember working on some, we'd, we'd done some flats in, um, in Whitechapel and it was new build. And I remember that th we had a tester, just a, new, a, new, um, a newly employed tester on the firm. And it was like he was like this this magician that come around and do these magical things on silly money, and no one ever, no one else really knew what he'd done. Um, so it wasn't really something that I had a great dealing with until later on. Um, sort of when did that when did this fizzle out? When did it get replaced? Two thousand and four was the yeah. last edition it had it in. So I think I qualified about two thousand two thousand one something like that. So. I, I didn't see much of this as, a, as, a, as what I would call a fully competent um, electrician, mm. but I do remember them. You, you raised a good point as well in this, is uh, testing, uh, when I was, uh, again, doing my industrial side of my apprenticeship, the heavy rail stuff, the inspection testing wasn't done until the very end of everything was installed, and then one of the governors would turn up with this thing called a mega, and would then do the applied tests, and it was very, very minimal. It was only with the birth of mm. Part P, dare we say that word, yeah, I think. Um, did people start heavily getting into testing? I can't. I, can't, I mean, I've not looked at the uh, the library of uh, the archive of regs like you've got behind you, Paul. But I think most of the time, the mm -hmm. purpose of testing has often been verification 
checking your completed work, just checking it when it's done. Whilst obviously we've had obviously that reapproach of initial verification and during the process, mm -hmm. they've just really blown it up. And it was about that yellow book in the 16th. I think it was 1997-ish when the 2391 course itself came in. Um, it was in the first edition as well as a note. Mm. The testing of wires, the frequency cannot be um, um, too um, lightly stressed. Right. So anyway, we're not going to talk about the first edition. So this was this was an interesting one. It caused a lot of problems uh, on industrial. It, it had the same problem if it was domestic commercial. It confused people. Um, well, let's go now on to what we, we know and love. C1s for those present who are uh, maybe new to testing or new to uh, coding of electrical installations. A C1 is danger present, risk of injury, immediate reaction required. I can see it, I can touch it, it will kill me now. That's your C1s. C2, potentially dangerous, urgent remedial action required. I've always viewed this, lads, tell me if you disagree, um, that one thing needs to fail or happen for it to become a C1. That's the measure between the two. Single um, action. Single action, indeed. C3, improvement react, uh, recommended. That, again, is in the eye of the inspector. That's where the, in my opinion, in my engineering judgment, in my perception mm. of risk, there is improvement here. And then you can evidence it accordingly. But there is no immediate danger or no potential danger. Um, and then the last one, FI, everybody's favourite, everybody's friend. We want to give it a big hug. Further investigation required about delay. I always call that the time stop one. Um, but in my brain, I've always started with investigate in your brain and work your way through, which is why I'm an FI farmer. Sorry. Um, so in, um, in terms of how I treat a C3, I'd be interested to hear people in the chat and you, and you, and you, you, you two guys, I treat C3 as everything that's not captured anything else that could, could be allocated a code gets a C3. So if it's not danger present, if it's not potentially dangerous, it doesn't need further investigation. That's what I tend to use a C3 for. So would that be maybe a non-conformity with the current version of BS7671? Or would it yeah. be an example of poor workmanship that may not specifically be a non-compliance with a regulation or they're both? Both, to be honest, your non, uh, workmanship's covered, isn't it, in BS761? Um, mm. So yeah, I would anything that I don't consider C1, C2 or an FI, and I can put a code, mm. um, a regulation number against it, I, I think it's important that the client understands that to their current edition, there is non-conformities, mm. although they may not be very Yeah, important. I mean, Eddie said in the chat, uh, four should never have been removed, full stop. Obviously, C4, the old four was non-conform lines with BS7671. It created a huge list. Um, I, I kind of agree with that, but the trouble is, is then you've got the what's the difference between that thin line between a C3 and a C4. Now, it may be more robust, actually, to say improvement recommended. I mean, some people have suggested that we could have a code that's just crap. Um, you know, um, C4 would be, I can quote a reg number. What would C3 be? That would be a an engineering assessment, maybe. Um, where there's multiple other regulations. Maybe there could be a code where the C3 becomes, oh. um, does not comply with 7671 and there's another one for outside of scope yeah. 7671. I mean, there are, there are, there are different perspectives because I mean, there are some, there are some codable items of the old C4, you know, like a switch line, not properly identified, maybe sheathing missing from a bare mm -hmm. CPC, which wouldn't push you to think that it's potentially going to become a C2 in the future, or it's going to move beyond. It's just going to stay there. Uh, and technically, yep. it's not a problem with that. That could be on that code. But some C3s today, we want, and people want C3s because they don't want a C2, because as I said last week, they don't want a C2 because they don't want the outcome of a C2. So we're talking about, you know, right now we're talking the guiding on uh, buried cables in the wall. We'll probably talk about maybe SPD or absence of SPDs and things where maybe in the future that actually may need to be escalated towards a C2. Right now, for example, uh, we're talking so much about type ARCDs. And we know the problem with ACRCDs, and it wouldn't be completely um, stupid to think that maybe in uh, five, ten years, we might start seeing that creeping into the C3 to the C2 it's territory inevitable. if there's ACRCDs. It's inevitable. Dave, you and I both know from the many, many, many evenings we've spent reading M60364 stat suite of standards that mm. the, the type ARCD, if it isn't there, is eventually going to become a codable And thing, the absence of an AFDD. And it will creep its way up. It will creep its way in slowly but surely. Yeah. Um, do, you do, you think, do you think it would be codable? Do you think it would be codable just the fact that it is 
the incorrect type of RCD. If you went to a property and it tested fine, uh, the test button operated as it would. Uh, yeah, and I mean, fine. Would would that change it? If it was operating as it should be. Yes. Yeah. There's there's would... there's two sides to that for me. I mean, fundamentally, the testing process of RCDs to the guidance says that you should remove all of the equipment. So I would probably want to get a leakage clamp meter or something to show me what the leakage clamp would be as well. Uh, which we have discussed. If we can sometimes, yep. if we can develop that part of the testing to get an understanding of how much leakage current is on that RCD, because yep. uh, this is the problem: is if we test an RCD to guidance notes three, we've removed all of the potential leakage on the device, and we're testing the device with no leakage on it. So it could give us a pass, but when we put it into service, it may no longer be satisfactory. And that's the that's the bridge that we've got to get across right now. Mm, um, yep. And again, that's that's again that, that that's an industrial, that's in commercial, that's in domestic, that's broad scale. But when you think about continuity, when you think about improvement recommended, if I go to a build, if I go to a board today, and I find let, let's say I go to your row pool and I find one of your old boards has got all type A C R C B Os. Technically, there's nothing saying there's anything to code for that. But with my understanding of the A type coming in and my understanding of where we're going to go with this, because I look at six oh three six four so much, I could say to you now that is a recommended for improvement because just look at the trend, look at the technology, look at your equipment as you move forward because you want security to continue as a business. I'm not saying you must change this right now, but I'm saying you know, if we look and if we do a bit of research, we can see the way the industry is going to go. We can yeah. see the way technology goes. For me, just on that subject matter alone, um, it's, it's a C3 already because so, the, one okay. of the, 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 the big problem is, is it's already um, an external influence. It's already in the annexes, DC and an AC network, et cetera. And if we have manufacturers, we have a regulation, we have to follow manufacturer's guidelines. We know the likes of Valiant produce boilers that require type B RCDs. So if we're ignoring that and we have that knowledge, uh, and, and, you, and Dave, you've said something that's, I'm not going to say frustrates me or the other sentence, but yes, well, you're right. Boils your what? When we test, it does boil something. When we test and we are testing only the uh, domain of the fixed wiring, we are missing a trick with the connected loads because we may select and erect something for an intended use or utilization. Okay. But if the connected loads are, are mutually interfering, then that's a problem. And we are now in the world of EMC, EMI, which is the wine regulations, as we've said previously with uh, people, is, is heavily predominant on thermal. It doesn't really cover, well, it does, we just nobody really covers it in training or anything. Um, I think chapter 33, compatibility or maintainability, it talks about DC leakage in there. Mm -hmm. There's whole sections in the regs. It's, it's one of those areas that in... It's one of those areas and legacy of training, which we have just dillied and dallied and tiptoed around. We've avoided yep. it and we've not actually kind of studied it and brought it into training because there's no time. There's no time. Same with over voltage protection. There's just no time in those three days that we squeeze regulations. There training you go. Into. Chapter 33 compatibility. Um, or assessment shall be made of characteristics of equipment like to a harmful effects on electrical equipment or other services likely to impair the supply coordination of concerned parties transient voltages under voltage balance loads fluctuating loads starting currents harmonic earth leakage excessive protective earth conductor current dc feedback you don't look at this thing is again most courses okay. the lecture is going to go oh those are long words let's move on yeah. yes <laughs> they did in it. my 18th edition you know and that's um, it and the problem but is a lot of people on the guidance. course will go, thank you very much. Thank you very on. much. Let's move on. <laughs> exactly. will. But then what will happen is, is when something occurs and everyone goes, oh, it sparks, you can sort that out. We won't have the knowledge or understanding of how to analyze and break this down. And that's yeah. the problem, um, I think. But anyway, well, let's move on. Let's move on. Because uh, we could talk, we could do a webinar just on that. It gets confusing with some people. Right. So this is the main reason everybody argues over coding, obviously, the judge. Um, if people seem to think that they're going to appear in front of a judge. And as we've always said, the answer may not lie in the wine regulations, it may not lie in the electricity work regulation. Regulation 29, defense. Mm. Have you taken all reasonable steps to discharge your duty uh, to avoid the commissioning of an offense? Um, that's the one of the key regulations I say to a lot of electricians. Yes, learn six pages of fundamental principles, but electricity work regulations, that's the document, that's the thing you need to tattoo into your brain. Um, I want to I want to cover this again. Well, now I know what's going on. Oh, bloody hell. Go on. Can I, this is this is where it's interesting where we start to go into the industrial sector yes. in terms of of courts and law. 
liabilities. Yeah. Mm. You're, this is this is where most contractors need public indemnity, uh, professional indemnity insurance because Absolutely. equally, if you start to overcode and over insist on doing work that could be argued as unnecessary, then you could equally find yourself in court for um, taken by the client saying that you've made them to do unnecessary work and they want that they want that cost back. Board. This is where you're going. This is this is where it's fundamentally different from the domestic sector. There's people mm-hmm. on the other end that will will be looking. If some people, some um, not very nice clients, may be going, look, you you've caused us to shut down unnecessarily for two days while you've done this work. I want that recuperated. Mm. This is why a lot a lot of electricians are so firm in their want to stick to a guidance, a gu- an industry guidance, something they can immediately just put up to actually lean on in circumstances just like that mm-hmm. as to why they made those decisions. And every single guidance book, as you know, will have on page one, two, or three, you are not to use this yes. as your Bible. <laughs> <Some, some laughs> you will use this to assist your coding and your professional judgment. Yeah. The, co- the codes that you make should be yours. And they, uh, we, mm. we forget that as an industry. Because technically, it is impossible for me to write a book that will give guaranteed codes that are acceptable across industries and in all environments with all clients, with all levels of competence. It can't be published mm. because there's so many different varies there. And that's, you know, that's which is why we go to this. It's why we go to this document that Paul's about to go to, which you know we have to assess ourselves and prepare ourselves. Well, to I, what way. I did was I, rather than reading this out to you, I cherry picked the things that an inspector I think are rev- relevant. Um, uh, the first bullet point Neil is very good at: be prepared to challenge assumptions and proposals, ensure safety receives appropriate consideration. In the industrial world, we are absolutely swamped with due diligence, health and safety policies, briefings, toolbox talks all sorts work safe home safe beyond zero hundred percent safe all of these KPIs, all these things yeah yeah there's lots more management actions yeah now i'm not i haven't taken these and written these myself these are all in the document strive to be involved to identify potential problems an inspector does that look purely beyond technical considerations to address non-technical human organizational cultural if rail if neil wants to shut my railway for instance he needs to consider that when he's finding C1s and C2s and how he advises his clients. And that's what makes industrial uh, a very much a unique skill set or competency that you have to develop over time. Um, I think that's fair to say. Adopt conservative decision making, quantify your risks with relevancy sufficiently and support by evidence. Uh, be responsive to changes in operating environment. You might not be able to test when you want. You may need to test. Perfect example is, is, again, I'll use my previous, the DLR, they did EICRs at night with the traction power off. Every single RCD passed every time. Did Mm. it during the day? Every single RCD failed. Yeah. Pointless. Ripped them all out. I had the same, I had the same in the food industry when I did thermal imaging. They said, oh, you know, we're we're quiet then. I said, I need to come when you're on the full demand. And there are some like tactics where you go, oh, let's do 40% and let's calculate the rest. You can't and, and calculate why, demand when impedances, uh, non-linear loads come into play. You've got to incorporate full demands. And this document is really good because it asks us to bear in mind that risk assessment should be used as an aid to judgment, not a substitute. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really key. Um, be aware that developing over elaborate procedures can lead to poor compliance. Some companies have such ridiculous levels of process and controls. Me and Neil know what we're talking about in this one, that um, the actual doing the job and fixing the problem uh, can take months when it's something very simple. Um, but be prepared to engage in public debate. That's what we're doing. This will go on YouTube. It becomes a record of public debate amongst inspectors who are commenting on, on, on the webinar and ourselves. Uh, explain the quantitative aspects of risk with clarity and supporting evidence. Be honest and clear about your uncertainties and prepare to challenge misrepresentations, which is where a lot of the debates start. And my favorite one, encourage an open reporting approach and a spirit of questioning and learning from others. And this is where I put the codes on the seesaw of risk and how do we balance it. Mm. Um, So yeah, that's kind of a summary of that really. If you haven't watched the other webinars, please download that document. Um, Just on the, I've just looked at the text. Um, Mark Holmes emailed Worcester Bosch seven days ago about ICD type for a boiler. Still waiting for a reply. Um, Yeah, good luck because they've pretty much closed down for COVID. Um, and all they, all I've noticed they recently did a giveaway, buy a boiler and get a type A fuse spur for free. <laughs> uh, so, supplied by your AC type is, RCD. Yeah, supplied by your AC type. So that's, yeah. No. yeah. I think uh, a, a very British um, 
boiler company, boiler install company, very, very British they are, um, are actually training their engineers now to replace um, replace they, I think I know their company. They like, they like to do mini training competencies for their workers, don't they? Those yeah, they safe are, isolation and the rest and all this sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, it's, uh, right, yeah. so let's get into this now. Right, go. Of those pictures, everybody, what is commercial, what is industrial? Because this, this is a debate we had offline as to what actually is constitutes industrial. <laughs> Because to me, a railway, let's, let's, let's just throw it in there. A railway is industrial. But Dave immediately says, no, it's not commercial. So I thought I'd throw some pictures in there uh, and let everybody debate as to whether they think the selection and erection, the inspection, the, the criteria. Me? What kind of noise was that you just made? What? What was, that, what was that noise you just made? Oh, I'm sitting on a leather chair. Sorry, it's Oh, was that it's... Saint, Saint, all right, Saint Pinch did it. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> Yes, oh, okay. All right, fine. It's a squeaky okay. brand new chair. It's a fucking nightmare. Oh, Sorry. Some right, lover's so, tiff going on here, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Okay, so Sorry. industrial, industrial, you say. Okay, Go for, okay. Yes. Ex explain away. So um, the bottom right, I would say, is an industrial electrical installation. The top right, I would argue, is commercial. Um, the top left is, I would suggest, industrial. And the bottom left, I would say, also is industrial. Um, and the one in the centre is also industrial. Uh, now, the I reason I say that... Me. You what? I agree completely. So good. Um, the reason I say that now, I know, um, Dave, would you like to tell these me... These railway boys railways... stick together. That's what I've learned. I've learned Sorry. this now. Sorry, season. but... Um, oh, well, I was always um, under, look, I've always been under the emphasis when I... When, I, I can't remember where it was. I, I basically referenced it, but commercial is where you make money. You do something to make money. And industry is where you make something. So... Yes. And there is, there is definition there are, on that. You're right. There are probably areas storage. of railway where you are in commerce and there probably are areas of railway where you are in industrious. Fair to say? So yep. this is where I completely agree with you because oh, if you go to like King's Cross, St. Pancras, the shops, the retail, commerce. absolutely industrial. Um, sorry, absolutely commercial, commercial not industrial. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. But when do you then take commercial? So the ideal example is, let's look at a Westfield shopping centre. Everyone watching, we've all been to a Westfield. Yes, it's commercial by its very nature, but the electrical installation due to the magnitude of energy and connected loads, it's going to be industrial. The monitoring, the, the load management, everything about that is industrial. You're saying industrial is dependent upon the loading and the method of utilizing electricity. Well, or let me what tell the, you something. What these place is doing. So there are two sets of IEC, International Electrotechnical Committee. There he goes. He's, uh, fucking, he's fucking been researching standards. this. I have not been researching this at all, and I don't like oh, you, you, you just, you just yeah. found this right now, did you? This is why we were late today. Right. Um, <laughs> each two, no, no, it was because you two were talking. Um, oh, no. Each for two groups of defined environments. Okay, so the EMC stands, and, and, and this is where I've always kind of been taught from when I joined rail industry was um, railways uh, have uh, a heavy industrial electromagnetic uh, in, environment. It is just because of the nature of railways, 25,000 volts, 750 volts on the floor, etc., Mm -hmm. um signaling track circuits all that good stuff so mm -hmm. with general emc there's emissions um radiated and conducted and there's also equipment that has to be immune from radiated and conducted uh, emissions so the standards have residential commercial and light industrial that includes houses shops and business premises cinemas sports centers workshops and labs so you could in theory buy something for your home that could still work in a cinema potentially um but industrial locations with industrial scientific and medical equipment and installations involving high currents and associated magnetic fields or in which there is frequent switching of heavy and inductive capacitive loads and that happens on rail because there are large loads now if i picked a small station let's say i don't know epping on london underground small station are you talking about electrification there, though no i'm talking about the electromagnetic environment all of it Okay, because if you go onto a railway, you don't have a shop. You have a shop with twenty-five thousand volts, about three or four. So you're ago. saying Tesco Express at one of your stations is industrial? Uh, no, the internal fit out is commercial, but the electromagnetic environment. Is everyone following this? <laughs> it's true. It's true. So okay. if you if I got you. because on railways, Neil, back me up here, or maybe not. <laughs> Neil, um, I mean... Don't just don't back me up. So uh, on railways, all of the earthing schemes are connected together. OK, okay. Yes. so where you have a, a Tesco, let's say a Tesco Metro on a railway station that will be connected into the station earthing. The station earthing is connected into the traction return. So when the train comes in, everything will rise and fall at the same voltage. That's how railways work. Now, would that be considered an industrial method 
of managing uh, EMC, I would suggest it could be. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think we're differentiating um, what the Joe on the street would um, call a commercial industrial. Yes. Setting. Yeah. No, we're going heavier so, into to, it. To 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 more the electrical influences that may. Influence our decision making process. So, I mean, many industrial places may have a commercial part on their infrastructure. Yes. You know, does, does that mean you would? Ass- I mean, say, for example, if I go to a factory, there'll be administrative locations, there'll be welfare locations. Mm-hmm. And whilst I might go, oh, they're all industrial, the level of risk adjusts. Yeah? Yes, it there does. are people who go to work who never go into the factory. So, I'll give you there a People who go to work example. who never actually put on PPE. They just go to a computer and then go out. I'll give you a great example of a little pop-up shop on a railway station. Turned up, plugged into a railway station, no problem at all. Um, They had lots of electronics and stuff on their stand. And every time the train came in, all the light bulbs got brighter. Um, Some of the equipment that they had plugged in was burning out. Um, it was it was chaos and mayhem. Why? Because that 13 volt socket was plugged into a rather large few thousand amp bus bar <laughs> system, yeah. uh, and everything was just going everywhere. Now on these, and for anyone who wants to research this more, so I put this in as a piece of knowledge. Um, uh, BSEN 50121 is the Railway Emissions and Immunity Standards. Um, BSEN 50122 is the Railway Earthing Standards, which will teach you lots about railways. And if you want to understand any emc uh product standard or issue that could happen to a product that you buy um bsen 61000 suite of standards is product immunity and mm-hmm. if you want to look specifically um 61006 2 uh, 2019 is the industrial product standard so i could in theory turn around to neil and say right neil if you're buying any products you should check that it's compliant with 61000 2 um industrial immunity Standard you, for can, you, can you stop quoting BS standards? Because otherwise, otherwise, Dave Betteridge is going to be broke. Sorry, by that's the, the end of the webinar. You know, Sorry, he's, I, I learned this. I'll tell you where I learned all this from. All right, um, Shepherd's Bush. When we connected the lighting in, there was a Dali system. Yeah. And, and we connected it all up. We let, it was brilliant. It was a lovely little job. And we were going to re-energize it the next night and do the ZS testing. And the, I was there the early morning. The first train came through and all the lights started switching on. And then they were dimming and they were going all over the shop. And I was like, what the hell was all this about? And it was, yeah. it was coupling from the train that was telling the Dali system to switch on, dim, and do all these other things. And that was the first time I heard about EMC and just wanted to understand it. And It's amazing how many things you hear about when you experience them yes. first. A lot of electricians don't hear about things until they actually study a phenomena that they're having to cope with. But this, you know. this phenomena is now starting to encroach into the domestic world. It mm. already happens in the commercial world, and it most certainly happens in the industrial world, although industrial, a lot of things just go bang more than anything else. Um, mm. But it can affect, as we know, and we'll show you at the end of this, I've got a perfect example of it. Okay, dokey. Okay. Right, what are we looking at here? Right, this is um, a DNO head. This was sent in from Mr. Burke on Instagram. Um, P. Burke and Sons up in Newcastle. Did you, see, did you see on Instagram this morning, he had this cutter doing a conduit? Yeah, he's I never had these toys when I was. Oh, they have Mr. Burke. It's fair to say is the king of Milwaukee oh, tools. Awesome stuff. Um, but yeah, so this was a DNO head he found in a, an industrial because uh, his family does a lot of industrial heavy commercial fit out. And this is one for the ages. This is um, I've zoomed in and on the offending article. But um, mm. <laughs> you find that what would you code that? How do you even start? So it's obviously a DNO intake, but someone's been. I don't know. Is lazy? Naughty? Run the poll. I'm running. Cool. I can't vote. Of course, can't. So we've got are we looking it. at something like two 25s or 16s, a little like 25 yeah. mil towels, sort of massively stripped back and then twined together Twist, to make them... Twined together to go into that I'm assuming. Section, I'm yeah. assuming they've been stripped and then twisted together. Yes. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? It's a good one. I can't vote. No, I know you're not allowed to. We've no. got to discuss it. That way we no, look I can, stupid if we get it I'll look, I'll, I'll look at the polls. I'll look at the poll settings if I can adjust that in a minute. Everyone else is voting. Uh, oh, they're still F-I. voting. I'll give it a couple of seconds. <laughs> FI. <laughs> no. Um, C2 for me. One thing goes wrong when that is dangerous. It's poor workmanship materials anyway, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could ask all these silly questions. Is it readily accessible? All this stuff. But, I mean, it's going to be a C2. You need to get that improved, don't we? C2 yeah. all day long, as far as I'm concerned. One yeah. thing I don't know is 
Is insulation is insulation tape actually insulation? There's two sides of that. Obviously, when you look at cable jointers and stuff, there's there's a specific Scotch 3M tape which is passed as insulating yep. medium if installed properly because it achieves uh, some kind of dielectric strengthening. Yep. But then, if you look at BS seven six seven one four one six, does say that insulation shall only be removed by destruction or the use of a tool. And then you question if I can peel that off. In. <laughs> yeah. You know, mm. is this tooling? Yeah. No. So you have these two perspectives for that. It achieves an insulating medium if it's the right tape type. It's got to be a specific tape type. And I don't think this is. This is mainly used for identification, if I'm correct. Uh, this kind of colored stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, if you can, you can remove it. 416 does say that, you know, if it's insulation, you cannot remove it unless you destroy it or use a specific tool. And so I would go to that with this kind of stuff. But also, yeah. I'd also see to this, because this is something that with the, um, you have to forgive me if I've got the manufacturer wrong, is it the, the whisker the things now that clamp the towels? Because I mean, there's no, there's no security to be, for that to be grabbed and pulled out. There's no um, security yeah. of the clamping of the cables to make sure there's not going to be used a coat hanger yeah, or whatever. Yeah, prevention of strain on yeah. conductors. Yeah. 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 But yeah. let's see what we've got. No, I agree. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we glance past these tails all the time. Um, mm. But yeah, there we go. 87% C2. 8%. Good Eight, on you. 87%. Fi. I'm going to read, I'll, I'll read out the picture. winning one because obviously the recording doesn't catch it. 87% C2. Good. Great. Right. Let's, uh, if my computer works, oh, I need to throw this out the window. So this is, this is an interesting one. That, um, so this is one from my personal collection. So this was found um, on a crossrail enabling project 14 years ago and it was a um uh what do you call them a concrete batching yard right uh, in west london and the concrete batching yard um was basically we were we were going into that land area and we were throwing them out and so they'd left this building redundant and we were stripping it out and um when we took obviously the the cables out and the tails we found that inside the main the main fuse the main switch gear um if you were doing any icr i thought what would you code that because that has taken some serious effort serious serious effort 100 amp fuse it's fitting in the main switch well, for I a am... cement batching yard is there, is there a time limit you want to let to pass before we start throwing codes out or is it just throw them out I'm just throwing it in there. Just throw your opinion, yeah. Well, quick and dirty. As much as it pains me to say this after Paul constantly throwing me under the best for the non FIs I raise, I'm going to FI this um, because I'd want to know more about what the cause of that was before I coded it. It's definitely a C2 as a minimum, but I'm on the yep. I'm on the fence with oh, this C2 or C1, so I'd want to wait a minute, further investigate wait a that. He has just it. done what I did last at the first one, C2 and <laughs> FI. It's two coded, um, which which I agree with. <laughs> I would C2 and FI it. I've written safety um, processes for companies, and we we know where we, we companies that want processes and training to authorize their workers to go to a panel and reset a breaker. Because you have to tell them if you've got a breaker that's tripped and you reset it and it trips again, don't keep trying to do that you know because the device the ice you know the electro energy is going to then just smack you in the face and so if we have evidence of this kind of uh fault we then need to investigate further especially if it's not popped it if it, or if it's a device that doesn't pop so i agree we need to investigate really the cause of this issue instead of just coding this as well and this is where it's important to understand where the 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 reporting stops and the fault finding starts yeah, um, I'm very much of the opinion I'm here to re produce a report on how your installation is now and then give you as much information as I can using the tests that were carried out. And fundamentally, really that's... not really going to go into the, to the yeah. realms of fault finding. And fundamentally, that's a condition of the way it is utilised. But yeah. again, you can only do as much as has been agreed. Now, the good thing is, is I actually got to meet the guy who... Um, one of the guys who worked at the batching yard because we had some civils issues as well. And one of the former managers turned up there and I did ask him, did you ever actually have any power blowouts? And he said, oh, I've been here about 20 years. I think we had one, but we've never had any since. Mm. Wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder why. Cable industry getting hot. Mm. So the, uh, the poll on this one is a split with C1s and C2s. 
I can see. Um, yeah, I can see why. If which that was I mean, last week when you found that, you'd be saying yeah. that needs to go out of service. Yeah. And last um, week, Richard Townsend was basically saying, well, at this point, in both situations, it's going to be unsatisfactory. So you're happy. But yeah, half has gone, you know, 42% well, yeah, right, C1. Because, I mean, you don't C2. have fuse protection, so you're waiting for a fault. So for me, that's why I've picked a C2. And I need an incident for that to become a C1. Yeah, I, sort I mean, of, I sort of heard what Richard said last week. And the, the thing that sort of was on my mind was that, obviously, we're not in control of people's budgets and we don't know how much they've got. And it may well be that a company's really struggling mm. and um, they can only afford to do the C1s. So it is really important that we do get them C1s and C2s as accurate as we really feel comfortable. As accurate as we can. Yeah. Uh, again, I mean... This is goes back to what uh, Melbourne Ville would say. Oh, I'd make if if I had a C one C two kind of thing. If there was spares of these, if I could access a wholesale to get me a new thing, I could then just elevate that to a C one to do that. As long as the client's happy for that work to be done, right, let's, let's and we're making on. the system safer. Okay, um, I think that was a good balance. Uh, there was some good was, judgment that was, in that. That was a dead split between C ones and C twos. So yeah, I, I thought there was some good it's judgment good on it, but for me, it's definitely a C two, and the FI would be a, a stern bollocking and a. I agree, isn't it? I agree. To me, it's a C two because there's only a problem if a fault exists. Yes. Um, yeah. If you know, so that's it. But the, the conclusion I'll, is the same. I'd be very surprised if that fuse was designed to operate in that way. Yeah. So something's wrong. So here's another one. This is in a, um, a workshop of a garage. Um, one of my big bugbears in life is um, corrosion of containment. <clears throat> Just porous walls, sticking containment straight onto porous walls. I said it. Oh, here we go. It's disappeared again. Um, yeah, porous walls, um, corrosion over time. You know, you've got the bit of plywood, which the board's mounted onto. That's obviously had some sort of water leak or water damage over time. And yeah, uh, that's that's your main tails. That's your main intake. And let's replace it with galvanised trunking again. Yeah, absolutely. Touched, that's... touched on that last week. You know, if we, if we just take that lid did, yeah. off and uh, replace it with the same problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, so this this would require a bit more work. GRP is not a myth. <laughs> it's, it's available. We can get it now. We can do it. Um, but yeah, so it's a good one. Would you want to investigate further to see if there's actually, you know, physical damage here, or is it yeah, just I mean, as an inspector? Yes, um, I would. I would start at C three. It requires improvement, um, and I. But I Maybe would, just I test would it with advising. your pen to see if it goes through the thing. Yeah, I mean, I've got video footage of floors where you can put your fingers through the joists and stuff. But yeah. um, for me, I would. I would be starting at a C three um, because that's within a controlled area, as well. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth noting that. Um, but it's it's crap. It needs further investigation because there could be a water ingress problem. But what I find is there are certain builds where the minute you mount onto any sort of porous brick surface, especially if there isn't an air gap behind that wall, um, you'll find you'll just get damp condensed coming in. And this is why when I when I did my apprenticeship, I was always taught put Unistrut on the wall. Mm something that's yeah. you know can be can you can see the signs of corrosion well, again i've seen the same with a thermal camera where you put a panel on the wall the actual you know a lot a lot of a lot of feeder pillars that might be single skin where there's solar loading they actually will warm up those panels you need a bit of spacing yep. for heat impact and also for moisture In fairness, um, i do like grp unistrut now mm. i think that's a cracking idea because that's a great barrier uh to quest prevent that corrosion spreading yeah, question in the chat here, which I will raise because I know this is a passion for you, Paul, that you hate. Bending radius on some of those tails, David says. I oh, know, it's all fucking awful. These are oh, well uh, this little, uh, awful. this little tactic of little pigtails, and you know, L L three in particular, there looks a little bit. So, but can I tell you something? As someone who's done <clears throat> metering training, that is an endorsed and approved helix that they will actually say to you if you haven't got the space, bring the tail up and do a helix and put it in. They mm -hmm. don't give a toss about bending radiuses on the metering companies. Don't ask me why. Okay, no, just don't. So, so for oh, me, a very good one. So for me, this is a C3 unless that trunking is a CPC. Then I'd up it to a C2, which Ooh, you raised, good... which you raised mm -hmm. last week about your experience is, in the rail. It doesn't look like it is no. in this case, but that would be the only caveat. So, based on the photo, this is a C3 for me. Yeah, we'll, we'll come agree. on to that, funnily enough. That's, that's yep. a good good. And um, the poll has got a 44% C3. Yeah. 
36% FI because they want to obviously look at the condition of this. Mm. It's drunken. Um, but this is what I like about coding debates is you build a picture and your mm. brain then wants to know more, wants to exactly. investigate more, understand. I mean, I mean, what I can't see from this photo is the angle is obviously those tails, are they carrying on all the way through to the fuses and there's no single insulation exposure from the outer sheath being stripped in the trunking. You know, if, question. If, if that's been stripped into the trunking, then there's a bit more so risk. So as the inspector, so, would you would you take the trunk and it off given the condition of it? I probably would not want to touch it. Yeah, I Because I'd be then the have actually. a problem. Um, I'd I would, stick a torch underneath and above. Yeah, I'd get a oh, torch on the top and I'd get my eye level down below. And if I can see grey at the top of the fuse holders, so I know that double insulation is most likely sound throughout. Then again, um, C3. In my yeah, no, I opinion, I would expect my guys to be accessing that. Um, if we're thinking of the, we're here as an industrial electrician, um, plenty of notice of this work would have been given to the client. This has been planned in over many, many months, probably. Um, it may well be the first shutdown or series of shutdowns they've had in a long time. This would be my opportunity, I think, to get in there and get to the bottom as much possible, possible much of the, get in there as much as we can under this mm. period, not knowing when it might happen again. What so Neil you, hasn't told you is yeah. Neil issues his guys brown trousers for this specific <laughs> piece of work so that they can go home and not be embarrassed. Can I bring up something in the, um, yeah, go in the chat? Yeah, um, okay, go on. Sorry, I haven't looked at it. I'm, I'm going to apologise because I think so. The, it's gone a bit crazy, but some one of the guys in there said um, the problem with C3 and everything is it's not going to get done. And that to me is something... That's, that's not our problem. What, what, what does not doesn't get done is not for the inspector to worry about. What we've got to do is inspect using our engineer, engineering judgment and code appropriately based on the, the hazards that may or may not be there and give accurate reporting to the client. What they mm -hmm. do with that report, that's their business. You've, as Paul likes to say, you've, 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 you've given that responsibility back yeah, to them. Yeah, you've taken all reasonable steps, Neil. And they, this is where the inspector then hands over to the likes of, of the managing director or the person issuing the report to the person ordering the work. And that's where that danger notification can come in because you could have a report that's got, say, 25 C3s on a, on a, on a big warehouse somewhere um, and a couple of C2, C1s. Now, you can still issue a danger notification on the cumulative effect of those C3s, because you could turn around and say, look, in my opinion, this installation will be dangerous in the next five years. I have to take all reasonable steps, so I'm gonna issue this form to you. Those sorts of small things push clients to do the work. And I don't mean push them in an unethical way, there's enough standards out there outside of the scope of 761. There's enough health and safety legislation that if we push our boundaries in doing our discharging of our duty of care, you can ensure that the work does occur. And we did cover that in our asset management webinar a little bit where we, we coded and, and used asset management terminology to help them understand the remaining life of the asset and the operational impact. And that, that's where the C3s get done. But some clients are just bastards. They're uneducated bastards, and they'll they'll never do that. And then that's why the danger notification. And I mean, I've is, got a pack on my shelf. It's fa it's fair to say that you shouldn't. There shouldn't be a C three and a danger notification. That that shouldn't wouldn't be, it no. should never happen, uh, because you'd hide no, under a C two or C one. I yeah. use so, that term if I'm working for a bastard, by the way. Just so clear. I mean, in this in this particular image in an industrial location, this could be a room that no one ever goes into except yeah. for the electrician. I mean, this might be a place where they store cleaning stuff they shouldn't but yep. some places will do that but it might be a completely dead void space so you know the next person in here is going to be probably you the next time round. does that in any way um escalate the 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 need for you to fix this but then you're talking control measures aren't you you're, well, you're it's like neil, neil said that he would want his guys to look into this so i'm thinking okay well in that case would you with your client get um, pre-authorization for the risk of damage from dismantling because if you take that lid off and that rust obviously comes away and you can't put it back have you agreed that some dismantling might warrant a remedial cost for the inspection or have you got maybe a coffers to yeah. cover some repair work from your dismantling Do you know what you've you've nailed it on the head there actually and, and I think we probably didn't touch upon it enough at the start um, that extent and limitation um, is is not only uh, crucial, but in industrial, 
I, I agree with you. If you're doing an EICR, it may be a very good thing, and I'm sure Neil will agree with me here, where you do have a small pot of um, money for these sorts of things to happen, um, where you'd say, look, I don't know, I'm going in, I'm doing this. It may be of such a poor state that just coming near to the damn thing causes some sort of failure. Mm. Um, I, I can put a, a provisional sum in where if this happens, I take a photo, time date stamped, I send it to you for uh, a thumbs up, and while I'm there, I can get it done, get it addressed, etc., or plan the work in. Yeah, I've okay. seen um, I've seen this uh, covered many ways. Um, sometimes the client will agree on no more than fifty pound a C one, something like that, which could quite easily be done. I mean, sometimes yeah. to make to take a C one away from to a C two or even a C three, it's relatively a quick thing. Um, uh, other things have been happened where if you're in some, some sort of a main, maintenance term contract that the contract will raise a, a reactive order, uh, maybe a thousand pound or something for the term of that um, inspection that you can spend up to a thousand pound creating stuff. It's all about relationships with your client, be open yeah. and honest. And, and uh, my dad always said, every business is people business. If you're a good, good person, if, you, if you, you're honest, open, treat people, uh, give people the right information, they will trust you. They will, they will they will listen to what you've got to say and nine times out of 10, act properly. Ken, all, all you're doing is working within your own competence and, and you know, an authorization. They've got you to do that. And yeah, you don't have to completely overwhelm them with engineering waffle, just common sense of risk. And also in terms of, it's, it's such a big question in terms of where are you testing? You mm. know, if, 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 if this is like, there's, there's a place in Eastleigh, it's called the Eastleigh Long Welded Rail Depot. It's where they make, there's only two places that make all the railways, the actual physical rails in the country. Mm. Now, to get that shut down is, is really difficult. It happens once, I think, I, think, I think they have seven days a year. It's a 24-7 operation. Yeah. A seven lot happens a when that goes down. And can, it, yeah. it, you know, they're not, they don't want to be hitting there going, oh, we've got to wait another year before we do a C2 or C3 repair. They want mm. that done. So there's got to be a, a, this has got to be agreed up front, as you said at the start, Dave. Start agreeing this thing up front. If you're a competent contractor in doing this sort of work, you should see these pitfalls months but that's, before they that's happen. That's a key word you've just said, Daniel, competent. Because again, if you're on a site and you're obsessing risk, you should really have the skills, the tools, the workmanship to remedy or to make safe at least that yeah. risk. Otherwise, you're basically, yeah, you're working competently. I, I can't think of it any other way. That. We have got. Did I share that one? Or oh, I can't remember. It's this one I shared. This one? C3s. I think it's this one. C3s and FIs. Yeah. Yep. I've already done this. Yeah, we've got 44% C3 and 36% FI. So 19% um, C2. Uh, just look at me to, uh, oh. just having a quick look at the comments before we move on. Yes. Uh, can you give a certificate shorter than five years? Of course you can. Can, can we can we just can we have the 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 elephant in the room debate quickly that Good schedule debate. in um guidance note three with the um frequencies and stop looking at it yeah. look at the bits before and after it that it's about engineering judgment yeah. it'll yeah. most likely disappear soon anyway it's disappearing from the code of pa uh, the pat testing book so yeah. my yeah. my yeah. understanding is that the guidance note three the thing we talk about that is for designers from verification to first inspection Correct. So when we carry out a design, I will sit there and I will put part of that, that this is to be um, <laughs> inspected initially three to five years is normally where I go. Um, after that, the standard inspector on the ground, they choose, I've signed things off for six months before. Yeah, you know, again, it's very in, unusual, but... Yeah, but that in, period, in that period from initial verification to the first periodic, the user, the utilization may have changed, the demand may have changed, the environmental characteristics may have changed. Mm -hmm. So you can't repeat and regurgitate frequencies. Mm -hmm. You must always be reassessed. It's one of these rules of thumb hearsay things have caught on and, yeah. and, and it happens a lot in our industry. It really does. Um, but yeah, kick that one straight into touch. It's for Unfortunately, the, it's for again, the a lot of people doing this work want, as we said earlier on, they want guidance to lean yeah. on. Rule of thumb. Because as you said, you said if you test too frequently, if you do too much, if you don't test enough, you've got that. You've got to find that equilibrium where you're actually mm -hmm. not in shit street, um, yep. and you've got to have your own engineering judgment and background to support you on that. And a lot of electricians don't feel confident in, in getting that. And right, next one. sometimes is client pressure. Sorry, Paul. Sometimes oh, it's gotcha. client pressure. Gotcha. They expect a five-year inspection. Mm. 
But well, they, where'd you get that Well, from? they don't just expect it. They financially plan for it. They fall for it. Exactly. And that's exactly. because yeah. in industrial and commercial, um, they forecast their budgets um, and I've, they have architect not architects, um, chart surveyors who have these guidelines that are issued to them by industry bodies who say, yeah, mm. we have guidance, guidelines. Follow this. And, and that's what you can financially plan for. Well, they don't actually say, by the way, if this is a 50-year-old building, it's going to cost you three times that amount. And then poor old contractors going, well, I need to do all this work. This is a really bad state. I'm losing money here because my clients treat me like crap mm -hmm. because of a book that the Charter Surveyor issued 10 it's years a, ago. A food manufacturer I work with, I've worked with all of their factories. They've got over 50 factories in the UK and some abroad. I've done all the electrical safety rules with them. I've done the thermal imaging protocols. I've done some other work with them. I've done competency assessments with them. And I know the engineers really, really, really well. And they've looked at their competency matrix. They developed their own assessment methods. Some of them are chartered engineers. Some of them are even, you know, members. And so I think there's a couple of fellows in there. And we said about, you know, things like patch testing. They go, no, 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 no. I want to use my contractor that I use, that I trust, that I know will do the job properly. He'll do it correctly. Any cost sort of amount that I have in my budget. And they'll go with that plan. Then some prat from a head office who's nowhere near related to that factory from procurement will go, no, 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 no. Use this nationwide approved contractor mm -hmm. that does it at 40p an item. Basically cuts the bollocks off. Yeah. Yep. Completely agree. Right. You moving know? on from pat testing. Because we want to get done in record time. <laughs> to your sandwich. This is, yeah, sorry. Oh, has your McDonald's dinner. arrived? Yeah, my McDonald's arrived. Nom, so nom, I haven't nom, eaten nom. all day. I know I'm fat enough, but hey. Um, all right, what are we looking at here? Two compartment trunking. Yep. Ooh, fixed place um, connectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, connector blocks on a cable. So you're an inspector. You've come along here. You've opened it up. It's, it's heavily corroded, but that didn't stop you opening it up. Um, <laughs> And um, this is the mess you found. As you can see, there's, there's exposed singles there. There's bonds in there. You can kind of make out the divide. Um, the top part has immediately, my eyes are attracted to the, those um, uh, connector blocks that are screwed into the back of the trunking. But I'm looking at a number of things, rusted fixings. Um, it's cable management at height. So what um, voltages that, have we got in here, roughly? So, we so we've got a mixture. We've got comms voltages and we've got LV voltages. So we've got band one and band two systems. Yes, band one, band two. And that, that connector is actually, just to give everyone a clue, that connector, before we run the pole, is actually a PA speaker. So it's a public address system. Um, and that's because it was in a very, 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 very large airport. One of the biggest in the UK. Uh, back of house. Okay. Mm. Oh, let's run a poll. Is there anything else we need to know about this? Um, that's it, really. It's just a rusty um, trunking running around a boiler room. All right, yeah. I'm not too concerned about this. Um, I'm swaying towards a C3, probably <sighs> between C3 and no code, really, because um, the corrosion does very much look like superficial corrosion. So, I'm... but I'm more worried about spot, the fixings. Do you want to show that? What I do spot. Is the twin and earth now i look at that and go right i've got someone here that thinks this needs metallic mechanical uh, protection mm -hmm. and someone else who doesn't so mm -hmm. which one of them's right which one of them's wrong i would hazard a guess that that twin and earth shouldn't be there but that is just a guess based on the photo we've got so i'm more concerned about the twin and earth than i am about what's inside the trunking to be, so to be honest i'm i'm looking at this from the rear of the trunking is corroded I'm looking at the fixings, which are corroded. Um, remember, we took the lid off, so that's fine. So Neil is absolutely right. It is a lot of superficial trunking. But Was this on the wall, sorry? Yes, well, it's on the wall. So if, right. it's, if it's coming through the back, then uh, again, if I look at one failure, could that potentially be dangerous? Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, if I can sit on the fence between a C3 and a C2, I would. But if I did, I'd probably need to go to hospital to have the splinters taken out my arse. So um, I'm probably <laughs> going to go for a C2. I'm going to ask another question. Is the PA system on this installation used to announce an emergency situation at the airport? Good question. Yes, it is. Good question. That Good question. changes it completely, doesn't it? Absolutely changes Life it. Life safety systems. Book. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I would... I would, I would Let's yep, run the poll. I'm saying this. I would C2, FI... To then to, to put it with the uh, the fire people to have a look at. Just, just remember, everybody, Neil is the one FIing all today. <laughs> no, I'm, so, I'm so annoyed. Yeah. No, that's that's. Uh, I was on a C3. I was on a C3 until Neil asked that question, basically. 
So yeah. Um, okay, let's get the poll run. We have, and we have got oh. 76% C3, 16% C2. I know it sounds mad. Yeah, I love that. I love what I'm seeing on that poll as well because it's good. C3 is a good best place to start. And again, it's that application of more questioning. And I was on a C3 right until someone said about the potential of it being an essential or a safety system that could obviously fail if those fixes. Yeah, I, I was on a C3 to be fair. I was, I was on a C2. There. I was just waiting for Neil to do it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. Right, next one. Um, this is a classic. Ooh. So now industrial, and the reason I've put these photos in, industrial brings all sorts of weird fancy stuff. And it's fair to say industrial can bring some classic electrical installations and some bespoke electrical installations. So this, um, I'm going to look at the chat and see if anyone can guess what this is. Now, it's obviously a consume unit. It's an old one. Um, they're 3871 um, breakers. Mm -hmm. They're Crabtree ones. Um, yep. It's a three-phase board, but if you look really, really carefully, if you look at the bottom right nut, you can see there's a green and yellow conductor there. And if you look here at these orange cables, because they are orange, um, they're bolted into what is a converted three-phase board. So what does everyone in the chat think it is? Yes, bang on. It's 110 volt. It's an old 110 board. Um, well done, everyone on the chat. But the thing is, is if you if you joined, the point being is if you joined from domestic or commercial into industrial, there may be confusion. And this is where uh, the extent and limitation of your own knowledge and, and not being afraid to ask questions of the utilization of the installation and knowing your own abilities to identify this. This is a classic picture. This was um, this was actually installed Oxford Circus. This was um, mm. right deep down the middle of the underground um, bespoke panel uh, with the guts bespoke made um, very old panel, fantastic old piece of engineering solution really. But yeah, it was 55 volt, um, not 55 volt center tap uh, bespoke double pole breakers um, classic really. But um, so would you code that if you were doing it now against the 18 from what would you code it as on a poll and see what people say. so much going on in this photo there is. you've got poor terminations um i'd say lack of labeling lack of identification bearings not terminated anywhere so it used to be in the london underground standard that all 110 volt was wired in orange whoever come up with that was a buffoon Yeah, I think, I'm not sure if that's thermal, that Adrian said, is that thermal damage? That could be thermal damage. In my opinion, I think it's just greasy hands, but I am guessing. It's dust. It looks yeah. like age. It's dust from a failed IP seal. So a heavy, if you go deep down on the underground, the piston effect of the trains, unless you have fully IP rated stuff, um, then what you end up is with um, uh, um, pressure, just pushing dust into it. You, If you look on the underground today, you'll see loads of IP65 lights, but behind them, it isn't IP rated and the dust just gets in the back and fills the glass. So the glasses all fill up with dust. So if you're going to apply IP ratings, apply it correctly and install it correctly. Otherwise, it becomes detrimental to the to the. Um, That's just changed it all for me now. Thinking, see, I, I, as I'm, I'm going I'm ver to verbally go through what I'm thinking. So I'm thinking London Underground Station, closed environment, electrical distribution, uh, oily dust being pushed into that distribution, switching, tripping. I'm starting to think differently now that the pool's gone down that road and where I was looking thinking, well, this is probably just a C3. I'm now hearing towards a C2 um, based on where we are, the, the, the danger if that does go bang, what the, the mass panic, major station, huge mm. uh, potential of evacuation and, what, and problems. It's, what did this it's supply a completely different for? beast. So this actually um, is a standard detail across most London Underground stations, and it supplies the 110 volt cleaner sockets, which have to be every 30 meters on a platform because they right. limit the extension leads by 15 meters. Good question. Okay. But yeah, they're everywhere. I'm going to say C2, just just based on the IP rating. Clearly, something needs to be looked at in terms of getting that dust in there. Shouldn't be in there. Yeah, I would. I would. Probably want to look at um, 
so obviously the connections and the and the risks of you know arcing contacts with that contamination in there. And if I see that contamination getting into those points of arcing or contacting there, then I would be C two in that as well. Otherwise, there's no, there's no spaces from the from the is it? yeah. It's, it's... Otherwise, I would just um, I would I would yeah. It needs improvement at least. It's old, so, and I'm, I'm a C three on this. It's also interesting. Um, when do we start looking at people maintaining this? They're taking that cover off. There's no safe barriers. There's no. Yeah. Are we looking at that as well? We, we, has anyone thought about that in the chat? Thinking, hold up, if I'm, is this now an acceptable well, again, method to we be have, working on? We have maintainability. And how many times have we seen uh, panels and control panels where there's been additional barriers put into them? You know, yep. we go to panels now where we're trying to divide up the mechanical from the electrical from the air. We're trying to segregate these services and panels and you shouldn't open up a panel and have unnecessary exposure. You should so, have IP2X minimum. Here's another one for you. If you haven't already voted size of those conductors, the length yep. of platforms are about 130 meters volt drop on 55 volt is extreme with those sorts of four mils. You're not going to get any sort of compliant volt drop. Uh, in actual fact, one of the biggest problems was, and this is a legacy item on the underground, um, was if you design a, a 110 volt system now on the underground, you're going to run at least a 35 mil into a junction box and then come down with say a minimum of six mil to your sockets just to try and achieve the ZSs and compliant volt drop. Here, London Underground would literally just run a four mil uh, ring or radial and that was it. They didn't care to put okay. on rings. It wasn't considered, okay. wasn't an issue. Uh, so that length, potentially the um, the ADS requirements are probably not achievable. They would need to be looked into. <clears throat> yeah. So Which if would push I'm, it into a C2. Yeah. So that would push into a C2. Well, I, would, I would code that on a visual based on what I'm seeing. I'd go C3. Mm. And if I considered it more on applied engineering judgment and people questioned me, I would say, well, the installation itself sits at a C2 because under fault conditions, can I, has anybody checked the yeah, ZSs? Well, Will they pass? When you've got long lengths, I always look at the ZSs. And if there's RCDs, I also look at the fault currents, the short circuit currents with long lengths. So what have um, people voted on that? It's pr pretty split, really, because, again, we're kind of adding information as we've been talking through it. And uh, you know, Neil's been adding some bits as we go through. So we've got a real mix. We've got 14 Ooh. people, 37% have gone C3. Then the next one, 34% is FI. And that's because, again, there's lots to explore in that system, I expect. I like the use of the limb. 11% mm, limb. Is that limb because of the extent of the inspector's knowledge, perhaps, maybe? Uh, well, no, the limb has to be agreed. So mm. whoever's voted mm. limb is assuming that whatever they've limbed is agreed. I don't... Mm. I'd like to... If, if you have said limb in the chat, please explain your reasoning. Yeah, I'd like to know. understand where you're going with that. Yeah. Mm. It's good. That's a good balance. I like, I like people's... I like to see different people's thought processes on this. Um, okay. Right, we'll come back to that if somebody does explain. Now, here's another one for you. So this is a... Um, uh, uh, just a really old, old switch room. Uh, it was feeding. What was it feeding? It was it was behind the London Underground station, but it was f supplying uh, a uh, not a chop shop. What are they called? Garage. Chops. So it was it was actually it was actually supplying a garage as well as some London Underground equipment. Um, sure. I think it's a, a work of art. To be honest with you, because yeah, it's I old school. It's but what does everyone think? If you walked into that and approached it, what would your views be? Because I think that's a dying art, uh, building stuff like that. All angle iron, um, mounted distribution boards, good old-fashioned buzz bars, um, fixed traff light labelling. It's old, yes. Um, some of them switch fuses will have asbestos rope in them. Um, the, the blue uh, boxes on the right are 110 volt distribution boards. They were for the gate lines, because uh, gate lines run on 110. The stuff on the left was um, distribution in the room and a supply to the um, garage. I keep calling them chop shops. I shouldn't really. But it's a nice old one. Um, for me, I look at that, and I'll, I'll, I'll go first. This For me, I look at that as it's, it's, it's approaching the end of its serviceable life. Um, and the only reason I say that is probably because of the asbestos precautions we have to take. Um, and at some point, I may not be able to get spares or components for it. So my look, I might look to put in an investment to replace that. But as a code, it might be a C3 or an FI. Oh, I've done it again. Um, but that's it in time. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't bat too much of an eyelid on that. I wanted so to shut that in. 
what's your thinking on terms of uh, see I, I'm, I can't see anything in there that would give me give me reason to code it if I'm honest without going obviously no I mean you're gonna aside. yeah I mean you're gonna go further into this aren't you but from mm. the just the immediate observation there's obviously thinking maybe there's asbestos obviously uh, thinking um, about the white square on the right is a block diagram most switch rooms that have been built with some vigor and accuracy will have a laminated drawing which shows the electrical distribution on the wall make things easier so i look at a photo like this you've got a drawing on the wall um every switch fuse has got a label bus yep. bars labeled up distributions labeled up every swa coming like... out has got a label i feel like it's been a well cared for installation you feel, you feel yeah. like kind of saving it and going to every other motherfucker out there come in here and see how it should be done just to let you also know by the way that was ripped out 12 months later yeah and what they what they put in was crapper than what was ripped out. Oh, no doubt. Um, there you go. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you got to look further. Um, there's risks of asbestos, uh, but immediately there's nothing that I would I would go. Oh, there's nothing here that's that's. Uh... I'm with you on that. I'm not just like yeah. sounding asbestos. If anyone is is delving into the uh, industrial please 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 do do an asbestos awareness course because you will come across it a lot more than you would do in commercial oh, God, yeah. and mr skirm's bloody watching domestic yeah, yeah. Um, it's, and it's, ask, it's 30 quid 35 quid online and, and ask, you, um, money well spent and ask for the register when you arrange to work with the mr. client Skirms made a valid point any of asbestos c2 i think there is potential danger in it um I, again, is asbestos in the scope of 76M1 as a purist? No, but again, that duty of care, the professional inspector, the indemnified inspector. Um, there's definitely again, it's a it's, note for me, it's not code. It's a note. There's, well, there's an observation there, isn't there? There's an observation as a minimum to note to the, the problem, client without doubt. The, the, pro the problem is, obviously, because we're doing the work strictly to the model of BS7671, we then have to go to that. If you say is it potentially dangerous, yes. If you say which regulation, you go, hmm, which regulation would you say? And that's the problem. You don't mind me saying this is where industrial, um, we need to start thinking bigger picture on industrial because you miss stuff on the industrial thing, uh, uh, industrial installations. Um, there's more legislative obligation on the inspector as well. Um, and I think there's more to observe. Um, on industrial than you would have within a contained house. Um, I think that's fair to say, just through size of installation, uh, applied mm -hmm. use, environmental conditions, electromagnetic environment. There's there's just more to it. Well, it's, it's worth saying that asbestos is not automatically dangerous. It's um, it, if managed, can be managed perfectly safely. Yeah. That's why you have an asbestos register, uh, so it can be managed safely. Um, so that's what you worth find. As well. You do find with electrical systems, it's some for a lot of ele uh, asbestos assessors who do the marking. When it comes to electrical switch gear, they don't have that competence to take that out. So sometimes they, they go, maybe. You get that a lot. You get a maybe. So you don't get a yes or a no. Sometimes you do, uh, but sometimes you, you, you don't get enough so information. I, I grew on. up working on this stuff. Um, I've worked on loads of these English electric switch gear stuff and. I, I, at the time, didn't know of the dangers of asbestos, to be honest with you. In fairness, when we were opening and closing, we didn't really disturb the asbestos rope. But we had this debate at London Underground many years ago, and, asbest and their asbestos expert was, by opening and closing, you are applying pressure, you could release fibres. Mm. There is the risk. So it was ripped out on the basis of the fact there was asbestos content, not that the fact it was configured beautifully, maintained, well looked after, as relevant. Get rid of something that can become a court case. I agree, and this is what this is a really good point. So, what they said about this sometimes being outside the scope of an asbestos register. So, an asbestos register is for managing asbestos that you know is present. Generally speaking, if there's any intrusive works that will not be that will not be within the asbestos register, and it's certainly you're not allowed to work underneath the asbestos register. If you're going to work um, in and around asbestos then you need what's called an R&D survey of that asbestos to, what, to tell you, determine if it's what type it is, if it needs removing. So by the book, what I would do in a situation, I'd, I'd look at the asbestos register. 
if I opened up a panel and there's asbestos in there and that wasn't registered on that asbestos register, I would stop works. I would inform the client that an R&D survey needs to be carried out on all the panels that I'm working on. And depending on their results will be how we move forward. Yeah. That is the, by the book procedure well, that's, you come across asbestos. Your system of work has stopped because mm. you're working with their system of work. And if you find asbestos where it wasn't anticipated, that's not in your system of work. So you can no longer work to your system of work. So you're right, Neil, you've got a full stop and step back away from that uh, and not obviously step around it. So just on that, um, uh, one of the chaps has said, the only thing I would say is missing Adam Glover, insulated matting around the switch key. You can actually see at the base of the picture there is insulated matting, although they weren't stuff there. rich. Um, do not trust as he register. Be very sceptical. I agree with that completely. Um, you should not be working full under of, of caveats. Yes, you should not be working under an asbestos register. That is just for managing asbestos, not for working under. It's really, really important that you know the difference between that. Further information needed. What have you been asked to in the room? This is just going in and doing an EICR, basically going and looking at the uh, condition of it. Um, your safe system work must stay. You must stop works. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is this is put in for a reason to stimulate that debate. On the old stuff is lovely and good but there's potential asbestos. What do we do? Management controls, procedures. It's all part of the industrial type coding debate when you're going into bigger distribution setups. Um, right. What did okay. everybody say? Did we, put, we, we have, we got a uh, 44% FI. Okay. 34% C3. I think that reflects the, obviously what you need want to, to look into it. Yeah. 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 You need to get closer up to, uh, to it all, don't you? So okay. this is a large, this is a large um, uh, industrial building um, with, it was like a warehouse where they manufacture stuff. And I want everyone to look at the picture and see if they can spot in the chat just very quickly um, what they can see wrong with that picture. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a little countdown and I'll zoom in. Three, two, one. Need the uh, countdown clock. Yeah, sorry, we're not that advanced here. Um, so what you've got is some um, luminaires that have been held up. So it's it's undergoing refurbishment, but during refurbishment, there is still a requirement to maintain site supplies, uh, adequate illumination, etc. You've been brought in to do. So I was actually doing this EICR. Okay, so I had this was taken on a digital camera quite a few years ago, um, and I loved it because I thought, great, you've got the industrial fit in there. You've got yeah, okay, temporary supplies ain't great. You've got that jack chain to pr protect it. Nice piece of unistrut and a plastic tie wrap holding it up. Really mm -hmm. defeats the object there. So I just thought, you know what? That's relevant nowadays because there's we always talk about premature collapse and um, you know the dangers of, and I, I I just think that's a good one. So what would people code that if they saw that in a a, a warehouse? Today. Okay. Are you specifically so, just talking about the cable tie holding method, light? The cable tie yeah. holding Not the rest of it, light. just that bit. Right, okay. Well, you can, you can go into the rest of it, but I thought I would highlight that bit because that was the bit that made me laugh. <laughs> no, I'm not even saying I can see anything else wrong. I just want to... It, it, while, while people are, both, uh, are doing this, um, so you're going to test the fixed installation. If this is a temporary... Yes. Where, where would you still document it? Uh, yeah, so the uh, the temp this building was undergoing a refurbishment for about four years. It was done <laughs> in phases. So the site temporaries, by the time they'd finished the site temporaries, mm. they were doing um, uh, they were doing pat testing. Sorry, by the time they finished pat testing, they were going back and redoing it. Um, and literally, the EICR stuff was a never-ending, ongoing because it was huge. It was massive, massive, massive industrial units. So by the time they'd finished, it took them a year to do the ICR on the site temps. And by the time they'd finished it, they were going back to the start and finding it all changed. So it was ever David, evolving. David Betteridge in the chat has made a good point. Yes. Was these site temps under three month inspections? Uh, yes, they were. This is, this was one, one of the things that I was actually brought in to do. Right. So that would be, I would see three that based on that then. I would see to it if it was um, not covered under three monthly inspections for site temps. So what about the is three monthly inspections? Seven three seven five is it, Dave? Seven three seven five. Practice for construction site distribution, power supplies. Is there anything in there? Possibly we might want to read. Oh no, someone's going to go and buy a copy of it. Aren't they? <laughs> Dave, uh, don't don't waste your time. There's only a bit on insulation monitoring, and good luck finding that. Um, yeah, 
so I just thought it was a good one. Um, I thought it was just... Uh, it's good. It's, I mean, yeah. Um, brutal irony, really, because the, the safety measures there was horrendous. I mean, when I say horrendous, I mean, it was so... It was like two days of constant briefings on safe, 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 safe. And then you go in and go, well, that's evacuation route. There's, you know, there's a, a light fit in there. It's got a self-contained battery. It's all up on these steel chains, which is all money. It's all time. And then someone just puts it up with a tie rack. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a C three if if there are rigorous inspections are in place for me. Hang on a minute. Now now I'm thinking that's outside my scope of an ET and I if there is three month inspections on the are we, are we coding this as the inspector of the site temps or as the inspector yes. of the That's building? where I was going. Yes. <laughs> are we coding this thinking like yes. as a We are doing three monthly EI stars. Well, we that's a C2 three, for me then. Yeah, we are doing C2 for me. Yep. Because the risk profile is higher during the transition. During the work. Yep. building, yes. That's changed it for me. If I was doing it, yeah, that's C2 for me. Yeah, same here. That's what great. does everyone say? I agree with that. Let's just see the poll. I thought it was um, a bit different to talk about premature collapse. And can I just go back to chat before we move on to the next one as well, Paul? Yep. Okay, so that's C2, <laughs> 59%. C3, 35%. Uh, it does create a, a questionable area if you're doing a fixed installation but there's temporary systems you've got to make sure, you've got to find out where your line is in the sand with your client are you going to take this in because if if you're doing it for the client to maintain operations of business that is all possibly encompassed within that and of course if you may need to go to 7375 well, if you feel one, that and guess what and guess what if you're the electrical contractor or the inspector that writes on the front 100% of installation 100%. covered yeah, then yeah. you've just signed up to that. So it's really vice. I always get onto my guys about this. Write a story about the yes. stuff you are inspecting as much detail as you can. So there's no, there's no gray area about what you're doing and what you're not doing. No. Yeah. Very, very, very important point. Um, okay. Before we move uh, on to the next one. Block between the yellow and white flex. No, it was a plug and socket system. Um, referring back to the asbestos, Daniel's just mentioned here about three, four, one, Dot one, how does the asbestos impact maintainability? And he's he's copied and pasted here three four one dot one, general, and it just says an assessment should be made of the frequency and quality of maintenance. The installation can reasonably be expected to receive during its intended life. The personal body responsible for the operation and on maintenance or the installation shall be consulted. And these characteristics are to be taken into account in applying the requirements of Pass four to seven. So, have regard to the frequency and quality of maintenance expected. Any period inspection, testing, maintenance, and repairs like to be necessary during the internal life can be readily and safely carried out. So, does the presence of asbestos compromise the ability for maintenance to be safely carried well, out? Given the emerging knowledge of asbestos and the hazards it creates, yes, it does. Now, when it was installed, it was safe. The fact of the matter is, once has, asbestos was raised as a, a national hazard, the client should have been aware in taking precautions to manage asbestos, including in its fixed installation, but exposing contractors, they would have to have X, Y, and Z control measures in. Mm. Maybe they haven't done that. Um, the fact of the matter is for me, if I was going into that room straight away, I'd be going, yeah, it's old, but it's fine. But the presence of asbestos straight away warrants mm. some form of action and debate. Mm. And so we may not find a, oh, there's an asbestos regulation, but we can look at what the asbestos creates. And that is a potential well, danger. Well, the asbestos for a maintenance stuff is activity. the duty of care, and and asking the client, how do you expect me to do this? It's how do you very, want me to maintain? Yeah, but this? we may want a regulation to put down. Yeah, uh, I think that I think that regulation is sound, but yeah. this is where we've got to start using our judgment. Now, mm -hmm. yes. generally speaking, and no one please quote this because generally speaking, the asbestos you're finding in consumer units and distribution boards is non-licensed. So. A lot of industrial uh, electrical contractors can attend the one-day course and remove that because it's non-licensed. That's right, because they tell you to just so, cut the cables and then bag it, don't they? Exactly. So it, yeah. it's all about you've got to look at you've got to think about these things and say, well, hang on, who's your maintenance contractor? Are they licensed to work with remove asbestos? Well, then that may well that may well change you from a C two to but, a C three in that clear, situation because it can be maintained by their contract. Sometimes it can be done. Some it's finding that point of isolation mm. to allow you to do that that chop and removal. But I've done that one day course, and that, and there were room full of electricians, and that was quite handy to know because for for us we were all we'd all worked around it our entire life, so there was no fear of it. But the control measure um, we thought was quite good the way it was explained to us of find a further higher point of isolation just cut 
don't disturb, mm. have Double bag. proprietary bags, etc., and remove accordingly. I thought that was quite smart. Yeah, but it's all about that sort of judgment and start to think about, okay, what are the questions I've got to ask to, 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 to code this appropriately to the best of my knowledge? Who's your maintainer? Are they licensed to work with this stuff? No. Right, okay, that's going to change from what I do as a C3 to a C2. Is the equipment looking like it's knackered? Is, you know, all these sort of things, there's so many different mm. questions rather than so just going, it's a C2. Tipping on, exactly. That's the point. You can't just say it's that, can we? Let's do some quick and dirties. Yes. So here's uh, Armoured on a tray. It's uh, medium duty return flange. And as you can, uh, hopefully you can see here on the picture, the Armoured has burst through the sheath of the cable. And that's one you will find on many an industrial installation. I know it's I inevitable sometimes, that. but I do hate it when armors show all of these scuff marks and things along. It's awful. I, I can't I, avoid it, I know. I, but... I, I make sure they're wiped down and clean. Yeah. I can't stand that. It's disgusting. Right. What, okay. what does everyone think? Put the pole up. Boom. So, I, so what, what's happened in this, this picture? So basically, you've got two armoureds, two, yep. two sub-main armoureds. The one on the right where my mouse is, you can see that the armouring has split and you can actually see the ribbing of the steel exposed. It's just me with my ridiculous hawk eyesight there. Um, I've zoomed in as much as I could on the photo. So has the really armour been damaged? Yes, it's burst, effectively. It's been damaged, it's ripped the sheath off, and you can see where the, uh, the armouring is. So but it's actually been physically broken, the armour. No, no, no. The armor's fine. It's the okay. sheathing on the outside of the armor, which has been damaged to expose okay. the armoring underneath. This is indoors? Yes. In a switch room. In a switch room. What would you code it? Now, remember, just considering how expensive it is to run armoreds, and I think that was a 35 mil four core at the time. Um, what would we code it? I'm just interested to see what a code. For me, it would be a, it would be a, a C3. However, knowing what I know now, um, you could argue that the, the life of that armoured has been compromised because obviously you've compromised the outer sheath, which means if the armouring was being used as a CPC, it could compromise the integrity of that over time because it could prematurely so corrode. Is the armour being used as a CPC? Is uh, there presence? For that one, no, because if you look to the left, separate CPCs yep. were run with the armouring. So okay. this is mechanical protection only. Okay. So I would be looking at... I'll be looking at so that yeah, if it was a CPC, I'll be looking at is the minimum cross sectional area okay to be used as not mechanically protected CPC? Mm -hmm. um, if it was okay to be used as not mechanically protected CPC, be C3, poor workmanship. Um, the fact so the tray work's CPC, all bonded, everybody, by the way. The tray work C, is bonded. It's a C3. I can't see anything yeah. potentially dangerous. C3 with a zip kit all. needed, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. This. I'm asking questions to see if I can get a C2 up potentially out of it. Yeah, no, yeah. No, is... Nothing's biting. It's a C3, and then find out where the electrical installation certificate is and whose name is on it, and go, what the hell have you done here? <laughs> if, uh, I'll tell you now, though, if that was, if the CPC was, um, if the armoring was the CPC, I'd be C2ing that, and I'd be, I'd be not very happy. What would it be? Oh, that, why would it be that you're C2? What would you say uh, is because potentially shortening I'm, its because life? Because I've designed that armoring for say 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, there could be potential corrosion on that armoured. Right, so, so you're saying corrosion, the impedance? Yes, corrosion. Okay. So, are you intending on not inspecting and inspecting your installation for the next forty well, years? Potentially, yeah. <laughs> because I could be a bastard client. Uh -huh. no, that, no, that's not. <laughs> I, I would see to it only, and this. Do you know what? I'm really struggling with a C2 on this. I would see to it only if the CSA required it to be mechanically protected. If it's a CPC. And even then, I'm pushing it a bit. I mean, yeah, stretching really. Yeah, I'm stretching. Really I'm trying to get the debate going. That's why I'm reaching, um, stretching it. I'm stretching it for a reason. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's fun. Let's right. let's move on because we've got some crackers coming. All right. Well, let's just quickly see what we got there. We oh. got seventy five percent C three. Great. And you would be right. You seventy five percent. Yes. Absolutely. And well done uh, the, the others. C two thirteen percent. Obviously, we're a little bit more crazy so than we I were. I thought. I thought this would be good. So this was in a this was in a warehouse. Um, and wow. basically there's a ducting system that goes underneath the warehouse. And mm. this was a reasonably new electrical installation, um, as you can tell. And um, some genius decided to create a diving platform for bugs and mice so they could come out of the swimming water. Um, none of the cables are duct rated. Are duct -rated. Um, as you can probably tell, that, that armoured isn't I, um, the armoured and the box isn't IP rated. Um, this is when we lifted up to find a fault. And, and we literally just found that. 
I love the amount of good workmanship has gone into that neff up. <laughs> You've got it spaced off the wall with Unistrut, 41 by yep. 41 Unistrut. You've got fixed base connectors, perfectly straight, gutter bolts. Yep. The, there's so much good workmanship gone into that. I don't, I don't want to code it, but... Oh. Yeah, Someone's used it as a joint in box um, rather than a, a scotch joint or a, a resin joint or whatever word we're using for it. Do you know what? This is really there a good example no of how it. things can happen like this. If, if, if that's gone down and done vital equipment in an industrial setting, that maintenance spark has had to get that up and running as quick as possible. Yep. All right. So this, this could well happen. Very, very, very common. So it could. You're, you're all absolutely right. It could be get it fixed, get it on, get it done. Nobody, when they lift up, uh, uh, the trouble is, is what it turns out is these ducts, when they did the civil's work building um, this estate, um, the outside drainage and the inside drainage, there was a little bit of a washback. So it turned out all of the ducts were filling with water, especially when it rained heavy. So that could be underwater soon. Yeah. Yeah. This was pretty new, in all fairness, to be honest with you. This was something we it's found. It's a C2, isn't it? It's a C2 yeah, all day yeah. long. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it has a big concrete really chamber on it. On what one. does everyone think? We do the poll. Uh, one question was, was the lid already off? Yes, it was. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, the lid was off. Oh, okay. Oh, that changed it then. Uh, hang on, let's get rid of that coding box. And what's the t So we've got... Um, and the access patch to the ducts, is that needed at all to get into it? Uh, it needed it needed a lifting device to lift it. It was a massive a chamber, uh, a little bit more than keys. You needed one of those little weedy things. It was a big, heavy, uh, the standard, big, the, the really ones. big, big drivable one. ones. Yeah, it was a big one. I would go C two then. But there's a floating neutral. Is there? Is there a blue? Yeah, table what it was was there was a um, a flex connected into the top there um, because somebody had wired or, or evidently had, had tapped into that circuit. And that cable had basically came up and was coiled up and was just, I haven't got it in the photo, but it was basically just coiled up. So somebody at some point when they did that joint nicked, and this is what I love about industrial, nicked a supply for something that they needed temporarily and just left it. They disconnected from there and just put the cover back and left it. I reckon that you was find um, these things in industrial. That joint box was put in there specifically for that tap off. Yeah, for me, it's a C2 based on that, but I could, I, I, I wouldn't fall out of a C1 on that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. The, um, yeah, we've got 75% C2, 25% C1. Do you know what? A good wrist treatment there? Sump pump. Drill a hole, get a sump pump wired into it, get a control system. Yeah. Got but they, <laughs> mitigate the, the drainage. Yeah, they got supply for it. They can also fill out. Supply had, for it. We had this at uh, a race course that I used to work at where we had these 63 and 125 amp three phase sockets in, in pits um, yep. and the sub pump failed and they were all underwater at some period of time. And then just before their annual season meeting, I had to go in there and just get in the pits and test them and clean them all up. So some pumps. Okay, Dave, um, this one is, is one of yours and this is based on recent debates on social media. So this is, yeah, this, 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 uh, what do you mean? You started this debate. I didn't start I, I just made a nonsense YouTube video months you made ago. You a nonsense YouTube video. Uh, okay, so I noticed when I was doing some, um, I can't remember what it was I was doing, but I was doing some research on something and I found a Hager document that talked about MCBs, RCBOs, and it said that if you have them spaced side by side, then there's a derating factor from their nominal rating. And I put a video on that. Um, there's rating factors for frequency, there's rating factors for spacing, and there's rating factors for ambient temperature, all derating the nominal rating of the device. Um, and over time, we've kind of gone back to that, and we've been thinking about that. And then you said on Instagram the other day, oh, you know, if you've got loads of breakers, you want to think about spacing them out a little bit, if possible. And you got a bit of a response, didn't you, Paul? Uh, a kickback. <laughs> it's an understatement. Um, yeah. It was a suggestive idea um, uh, based on, yes. Um, so the breakers that we looked at in your video were designed to operate normally at 30 degrees, plus and minus could affect the tripping characteristics of the breaker, i.e. heat affecting the biometallic strip within the MCB, uh, would make it more sensitive yeah. to any thermal event. Henceforth, if you had a breaker installed at, say, 40 degrees and it's a 32 amp, it may trip at 30. Mm. And, and, and so it's the same principle as cable grouping. And we weren't saying you must now space them. What we're saying yes. is if you have them all bunched together, unless I've got a nice stack, three-phase board, and I've got six 32s, and I'm running them at fairly 
large demand, nearly full rated demand. Mm -hmm. Let's say that they're uh, let's say they're cur uh, door curtains or some shit. Then they aren't going to be rated at thirty two by the manufacturer anymore. They're going to be rated so, lower. So are we saying that a manufacturer is saying that to install them side by side in their consumer unit or their distribution board may affect their operation and under high the top if 25 have, percent for example right, of their current you, rating yeah if you run them both side by side at full load so they're heating to their rated rate their rated amps then they are going to be giving off temperature which will then affect yeah. its next door neighbor if they want to reach the same temperature because yeah. they can't give off temperature together if one's off then the other one's on then one's off that's fine and, and the one observation under this different period of demands. The one observation we've made is is with these electronics that are going into breakers now, AFDDs, um, smaller RCBOs, RCBOs, they are producing more. They're always they're always warm, yeah. far more hot than what we would have a double pole, um, you know, Crabtree RCD. Uh, the RCBOs mm -hmm. now, the single verds, the smaller compact ones, they produce mm -hmm. more heat. So again, it's that mutual interference it's that mm. thermal effects generated within the installation it's proportionate to load proportionate yeah. to ambient temperature so we put a picture on instagram just to get people kind of reminding them to think about the external influences in the conditions and how modern electronics are now maybe need to be a little bit more considered because we are yeah. talking about with type a rcds and type b and mm. connected load so it was just and like, we're not like, we're not saying you must you must code this you must code this you mustn't yeah. do that we're saying obviously we need to make sure we follow the manufacturer's instructions yeah. we might not be aware of what those instructions are actually saying yes because they don't put it in the goddamn boxes no that's the problem they hide it online they hide and it this in was Hager. Some... Hager put this online. Yeah. This wasn't us that put it online. It was bloody Hager. You oh, go to Hager and ask him, they'll go, yeah, you're right. So on top of that, if we go back to the industry we're in, we're in industrial, yep. I'm mm -hmm. looking at um, selectivity. Yep. yep. Um, I'm also, what BS number are them breakers? Ooh, They're most uh, likely 6898. Uh, yeah, 6898. Yeah, 6898 and 61008. And there's a reason why that's there. Shazam. So, so I'm so thinking conversation piece 60947 in, should be the breakers we're using in an industrial setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll come back to that one. We will. So, so the reason you put this in, Paul, really, is to highlight these two breakers, these two MCBs that you can see are pulling the load. They're not hot, hot. They're on. Yeah, that's, that's, they look warm, but the, the maximum temperature is 30 degrees. These are just on. But yeah. you can see, if you actually go to the next one where you've got a higher contrast, you can see these two breakers are giving off a temperature which is now being absorbed into the adjacent devices. Can you see that? Yeah? yeah. So the, the standard temperature of the conductor under no load is being increased slightly by its neighbor. That so will the question then is... start to derate its, its capacity. So the question is, and are them breakers designed with that in mind? These are Crabtree. We haven't gone back to yeah. specifically look at these ones, but the yeah. Hager ones that we did, and I think Hager was it? acknowledged this. J yeah. JW posted another company that's done it. I don't know who it was, but another company's done this. But it's it's just a common thing under six zero eight nine eight and six zero nine four seven. Similarly, like the 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 ranges that the con the connections can reach. These, yeah. uh, these connections, these metals in the terminals can go up to 70 degree Kelvin above ambient. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. It's, it's also worth noting, if you buy a time, time switch in industrial, um, a, mm. a, a contactor or a time clock, in the manufacturing instructions there, they actually tell you to space it from others. And yet, Neil, you and I have both been to railway stations where they've got banks of them. There's no spacing mm. at all. And they are kicking off heat. I took yeah. I took some it's thermal about images. Yeah. from a thermal perspective. I took thermal images of boards with contactors where they were spaced apart with an air gap of one in between, and they were fine. Then I take some where they're all together, and you can clearly see that there is a impact. This is more the RCBO thing that Paul was talking about. Yeah. So th this is this is a, a, an industrial board as we'll recognise it. It's a Schneider uh, ISOBRP board. I'm um, sorry about it. I just wanted to show the context of this trunking above them below it mm -hmm. and then obviously a little bit more zoomed in but if we then go to the thermal some nice thermal images there that just show that under load and you can see at maximum is 42 degrees and, and these are under negligible load yeah electrical load you look at the mains there's not a lot being pulled here yeah yeah it's actually all the this load you, the heat sharing and then you've got dual heating 
onto the conductors, which is giving a little bit of a pattern onto the actual conductor itself from the device. So all this yeah. heat is coming from the devices themselves. Yeah. But generally, I'm not sure how you see this, Dave. So when would you, um, what sort of, is there a rule of thumb? I mean, we, we work to 20 degrees above ambient. If there is a, a rise in 20 degrees above ambient, then we will report that back. Is mm -hmm. there any sort of guidance that you, where, you, where you sit on that? It's, it's that's pretty much fair. I mean, what I do with the, what I do, I mean, some, some companies will do, oh, we go with a standard and then we go to X amount above. What I do is I will obviously look at the cable type. I understand the cable's limiting temperature. And I'll set, if I have a cable go over that, I'll have an alarm on my thermal camera, which will then go over that. In this scenario, there may be lots of circuits, but many of those circuits are probably pulling barely a couple of amp at a time. And I need to know that and then find the cables that are pulling larger demands and identify where they are. And if any of those are pulling demands at the same time, and if they're close together, can we reposition them in the board? That's the key. It's understanding what's on for how long and its demand. And then we'll actually see the proper patterns. This board has pretty much about three or four amps pulling on it. It was not a lot on. There's only a few amps, maybe seven amps at the time. You've gone quiet, Paul. He's still quiet. He's muted himself. Swearing yeah. at someone. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I muted myself. Apologies. Yeah. Um, just going into the chat, Mark Holmes um, has asked a question. Does it go the other way around where the DB is a cooler se um, seller? So if I use the Hager information, what I've got in front of me, mm -hmm. so at 30 degrees, let's say a 10 amp breaker will trip at 10 amp at 30 degrees. If we go to a cooled seller, a 10 up. amp breaker uh, at, say, 10 degrees C will not trip until 11.6 amps has gone through it. If I then go to 40 degrees, a 10 amp breaker will trip at 9.2 amps. The thing is, it is what I touched on earlier with the different standards. If in a cool cool cellar, in I would, I would very much like to think that 60898 is not the appropriate breaker to be installed inside a cool cellar. Um, mm, if I, it's, it, it, it. so, so we're going to cover this know, more because this all falls under pollution degrees mm -hmm. and pollution degrees has got to do with a thermal and magnetic environments and and there's some very good papers on this and, and schneider have been industry leading on this but Should i, I think this is a very emerging well no not emerging i think it's just a very unknown uh, how many people look at fires in boards and melted breakers and 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 link it back to a well, there was all these electronics and the ambient temperature was and this was happening and the load patterns was this. It's normally after the event. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff. So what we were trying to do is stimulate the debate because I said this, um, I've said this to my contractors as well. We're not taught this stuff in college. We're not. And unless we really start pounding on the manufacturer's door and say, give me your thermal characteristics of your devices, we'll never know. Now, I've been asking CP Fusebox for yeah. their um, data, which is why I put that picture up, it's to stimulate the debate. Not to say you must, you will, you shall, but based on that thermal profile, I would probably look at every two or three breakers creating an air gap just to allow that heat to dissipate. Why? Because if you look at the manufacturer's instructions for time clocks um, uh, and lighting contactors, they require an air gap to allow that heat, that thermal load to dissipate. The fact that they're just RCBOs for me and the fact that they're within 20 degrees of the ambient, I personally would not highlight this. Um, mm. I know the, the, the thing is with this thermal imaging, you, you re, and you've done this very well, Dave, on your webinars, you need to look at the, the thermometer scale, the temperature scale, because mm -hmm. they can look really like, wow, oh my God, look how bad They look hot, is. but they're not. But when you look at that, mm -hmm. it's not even 20 degrees above ambient. For me, I would not highlight that personally. This is only a problem if I've got circuits that are designed to run right at the rating of the overcurrent device. If I've got a circuit and I, let's say that I've got a circuit that's going to pull 20, uh, 19 amp or so and I put it on a 20 amp and I've put it between, it might be that that device, the thermal cut on that device has been handicapped by its neighbours if they're also warm under load. Yeah. That's, that's where we're going with this one. And, and this kind of addresses, it's kind of touched in the regs, the compatibility of characteristics yeah. um, and the pollution categories. We as an industry are not uh, emerging our knowledge sufficiently. And, and we're on this journey, which is why we're openly 
talking about it here because mm. there's no wrong answer at the end of the day. There's only, there's only stupid questions. And I think this one is something that I'm kind of excited actually to start developing and understanding more this, um, this, as we go along. This, this caught me out because when I found it, I was like, okay. Then I looked at the fact that why, has, why haven't I been told this? And then I thought, okay, well, designers are supposed to know this because it's design data, it's manufacturer data. So it's just one of those things that we just haven't so discussed. This was a, this you know? was a chat point. Um, well, this isn't a codable issue at the moment. This is just something we thought we'd address mm. in this because it, especially in industrial large distribution, Neil, we thought it was very prevalent as well. Um, here's one. I think this was Eddie's. Um, I think Eddie's in here. So this was sent to us yep. by Eddie Clements. This is definitely Eddie, there he is, of yeah. some sorts. Um, it looks like a, a good old fashioned free phase um, distribution panel. I bet when that was put in, that was lovingly put in. Um, well, yeah, okay. So if we look at the um, old fuse carriers, um, I'm assuming they are, yeah, rewirables. So I've, I've put this across two pages because nice. there was quite a few photos. But you can see copper? there, there's a risk straight away. You've got a broken mm. fuse holders. You've obviously got a, a non-appropriate uh, fuse wire in there. 4,000 amp. Panel. Yeah, I'd say it's about uh, 1,262. But, but things like this watching, just a C2 because we have to have a fault for it to be a problem. Um, Eddie, if Eddie wants me. to shine any more light on that quickly, he can do. But for me, I'm, I'm kind of C2ing that really because yeah. it's just, yeah. Based on what we look at now, C2, but other things I'll be looking at on this, in again, considering where we're testing, yeah. I'll be looking at single point of isolation. There's no yeah. isolation. What equipment is this feeding? Um, is, it, is it equipment that needs to be shut down quickly in the event of a fault or an emergency that sort of thing so these are the sort of things I'm looking at when I look at that there's no single point of isolation yeah. there's many other things that I'm, I'm looking at Eddie can't remember this one <laughs> 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 uh, I'm, I'm C2ing it but yeah my, my biggest concern is safe working practice is, um, just... is, I mean, there, there be a, is there not an isolator prior to this panel do you think it doesn't look like it because then uh, I'm thinking because the problem with that is obviously filling fuses under load. There's obviously I'm thinking mm. about you know there's an arc flash mm -hmm. risk as well there. Well, that yes. looks like it's been done a few times. That one. Yeah. If you look at the bottom pins. That's it definitely does. Been put in yeah, and you out can see on the blades. Yep, yeah. you can see that's been put in and out under load. You can see the yellow tape around the fuse carriers that are just falling apart. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, it's yeah. certainly yeah, needs... C two. Yeah, C two, isn't it? What does everyone say? C two, eighty eight percent. Excellent. Yeah, good, great. Cracking 88%. Well done. Right, moving on. Mm -hmm. um, this was another one sent in by Mr. Burke. Um, this was in a uh, industrial uh, warehouse. <sighs> Jeez, I mean, where do you start? There's so much in one photo. So much in one photo. Armoured, cleated, removed. Um, All over ship. Use of foam filler. Is there compartmentation there? Uh, twin and earth just hanging, strain upon conductors. Um, Dorman Smith boards. Can we see two then? <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but yeah, there's a lot going on there. Um, cables entering the board. It doesn't look like there's any real protection there um, from what I could see. I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, you've got some cables coiled up here. There's no, I mean, there's no fixings on the armor coming in. The bending radius looks a bit mean for that. There's be a lot of pressure yeah, on that. Put, yeah, this is one of those on things gland, where yeah. you're just going to go, oh, there's a C3, there's a C3. There's, there's yeah. lots to see here. And there's a few, you know, so it's a lot. It's one of those things. It's like on the face of it, I look at it, it's a C3, but then I think yeah. if that's just clean the store, if that's a store card, I'm then aiming towards a C2 based on the, just the poor, the poor droop of cables there that could easily be stacked upon and not protected. Um, I'm looking at mechanical protection. There's lack of mechanical protection that depended on the use of the room. Um, so I'm C3, but I could argue C2. I agree. I'd be, use. I'm going to go with C2. I'd argue C2 on that. It's a, C, it's a C3 unless I know some other things such as the use or the risk or... Well, for me, the lack of collapse as well. On, on the twin and earth alone is enough for me, to be honest with you. That's just enough for me because, again, you, it's, the, it's the application and the use, but the foam filler is just a disgrace. That <laughs> PU foam should, should be banned. It's yeah. an awful, awful mm. tool used by labourers to just make their problems go away and make sparks last hell. Okay, so we've got a 70-30. We've got 70% C2. Okay. Oh, it's just, just changed to 68% C2 and 32% C3. Yeah, I'd, I'd, so. I'd have a debate, write a small novel on that, on a C2, I think. 
Yeah. Now that's one that I would but, probably end up filling a few a few codes with. Indeed. But, but this is a typical example of when an inspector needs to ask more questions. Indeed. And needs to understand, right, what's the use of this room? What's the control of this room? You covered this lot last week. Um, who's it got access? Um, where is it? You know, all these sort of things matter in this in this instant and could and and it, it's important because it could the difference between a C three and a C two is quite significant. So it's important Indeed. that them questions are addressed. So trunking on a gantry. As you can probably see, um, these next photos are going to kind of delve into something which industrial is very, very, uh, it's not discussed enough on industrial, and that is selection and erection suitable for the environmental conditions. This one you can see straight away, there's a cable management system. By the way, all those cables are live, um, and because I took them photos, um, <laughs> it's pure corrosion. Pure corrosion. Uh, I believe that was in the... Oh, Christ. It was somewhere near the Tate and Lyle factory, actually, in East London. And it sure was a was worker's hell. gantry outside. But as you can see, it's it's pretty pants. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have another... You what? Uh, Mr. Skirm's leaving. He's off. Oh, sorry. Sugar, sugar, indeed. Um, C2, for me. Um, I mean, I, I, I find it ingenious that they've actually painted over the single core cables. Um under this that, entry that's there's an immediate painted problem over there. the rust because you have some places that go oh you know placed out of reach it's not a problem up there but there's evidence there that another contractor has been an immediate potential danger and whoever's authorized that work hasn't assessed risk during the work oh. for a painter to come along with a brush and paint exposed cables yeah. so, you know some, well, you can see where it's just flaked and flaked and flaked and then the vibration of people walking across the gantry yeah. has just made it slowly break and break and break and break. It's, it's, it's actually insane because the electrical contractor was actually prepared just to replace the lidding of the trunking. Again, rather as, than as deal Neil with said the earlier on, you've got, you've got, you know, it's just, this is near the water then, isn't it? So you've got, yep. lot, you've got rust, so you've got to change your wiring system, haven't you? You've got to, you've got to strip it out and start again. That's not, it's just seats all day long. Um, but let's not, let's think about this, you know, the electrical contractor can only, can only, can only go, by what the funds of the client's given him. And now if, the, if, if, if he goes back and says that you need to replace all your trunking, the client says, sorry, then it may well be that they've only got the well, funds. that's irrelevant the to the EICR. Or just take it back to I the know. coding. I agree yeah. with you because you want to fix it because you see that and you go, that needs to be fixed, period. What's the budget, etc.? And you're absolutely mm. right. But purist coding, uh, it, I agree with so. you. It's a C2. Mm. It, there's too much danger in that. Um, I've got a question. Go. Yes. Yep. So you've done that. Um, you've C2'd it. Another contract has gone back and replaced that for, for exactly the same material, galvanized trunking. You go back in five years, it's perfectly good, but you know the history. Do you code it? I can answer that. I can answer that, but can I answer that in a bit? Because yeah. we're now going to go on a little journey about corrosion and external influences. So That's a great question, though. Yeah, what was the answer on that one, Dave? Was it C? 97% C2. Great. Legends. Right, three, this is a quick one. Seasonal. This is a quick one. Um, what's wrong in this picture? This is a quick one. This is just to sharpen the pencil very quickly. What's wrong with this picture? Because when I first when I first saw that, I was just like, "Hang on a minute, what? What?" And this was a, this was a newly wired um, a back of house area in a um, large uh, manufacturing plant, and I thought to myself, "There's something." Something doesn't read right there. Now, by the way, yes, this is recently taken. So if I'm going to give you all a clue, colour. Well, I don't know the answer to this, Bob. It's, it's single phase. Got... Single phase yeah. circuits. Like what colour are the colors. cables? Face colours. Old no. face colours. Brand new. This is brand new. Yeah, so you've got red. Green and yellow, blue and red. What they've done is they'd actually said, we can't get any brown cables. So they said, sort of, we'll just get loads of drums of red. And chucked it in. Where are they getting the red from? Gee, they yeah. had it sitting in their garages. Oh, right. <laughs> it's literally, literally not. Before, they just, it, we got about twenty drums of red single core. We'll just chuck that in, and that was before, done recently. Before we code, then. So why is what's the reason for the exposed ends? Oh, it was um, it was being tested. Right. Okay. So we're in the process of testing it. So yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, it was they, being they tested. I, I was actually walking around while they were doing the uh, the works, and it was being tested. And I looked at. It, I mean, I had to. I did a double take, and I was just like. I'm going to relaunch the poll because yes. some people have gone in with a C1 and I reckon that's before Neil asked that question. Oh yeah, it would be a C1 if that was the thing. Yeah, yeah. relaunch the so, poll. 
Well, I'm going see three. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Assume, I think assuming they've there. assuming they've used the colours correctly to the old colours. They're using no, blues for been red and black. It would have been red and black, and this is yeah. recent. Yeah. It's just a complete mix up on the fact that they could get rid of some old cases. Is, so alpha, is, three, is, is alphanumeric marking also being used? Uh, not on this one, but no, if you look in the background on my mouse, you can see brown and blue. Yeah. Because it, literally I've, they did run out. I've seen many installations where they've got, um, they use a multi core like a four core armor, then they'll use two circuits in one, and they'll keep one of the phases would be yellow. Yeah, and the other neutral would be would be uh, grey or whatever. No, um, no, the regulations no. the regulations are okay as long as you use color and or number. So if they've used numbers here, alphanumeric no, numbering, no, no, then there's no problem. No, this is just um, we've run out of brown. Get some red in and chuck it. Then it's just non compliant BS seven six seven one. It's a C three. Yeah. yeah, and um, just just to let you all know, by the way, they were told to rip it all out and start again. Well, I thought it was a very good educational because I've shown this to a lot of Sparks and a lot of Sparks have gone, hmm. Um, so it's, it's a good one just to get the grey matter going. Check the colour. Check the colour. Ask the questions. It's a very deliberate you, was, this, was, this work, was this your work, was it? This was not a work, no. This, not was, your this, work. Was, this was someone I was helping right. um, going out to visit them for a day. So I when, when a you said they were told to go out, to, all out, was that... Well, I ended up going to the Tottenham Stadium and look what happened there. But anyway, that's another story right, for another day. Okay. Um, Right, moving on. Um, this is on one of my jobs. Again, this is a this is a colour one. So this is a Sorel box mounted to a wall. Um, there's a, a transformer there. You've got brown and blue in single phase into the transformer. You've got these wonderful. Uh, I don't know what the colour is. It purple or violet or purple, whatever we call it. Yeah, um, we we'll just go with purple. What would your observations be? Would you code it? Now, obviously, the lid was on before anybody asked, so it was hmm? behind a. A barrier but i just found this quite an interesting little setup um and again this was in this was actually in a railway depot so this was a heavy industrial railway depot okay so this was this was dc traction uh open buzz bars cranes all sorts of heavy industrial stuff um but isn't isn't violet one of the cable colors we can use for control circuits mm. uh yes it is it is. It was actually being used uh, for, um, I think it was used for 110 volt, if I remember rightly, because we traced it out to a socket. It was being used for 110 volt, which was why I was a bit miffed by the violet. But mm. yeah, you're right, because you can wire, is it, is it felv or selv or whatever it is in purple? I can't remember now off the top of my head. But there is, there is a color that you can self. use. Yeah. Is it? Violet possible ELV, yes. Uh, looks pink to me, not even red. Paul, yeah, your eyes are as good as mine. Then, um, <laughs> so the guys, still yeah. buying, oh, I'm using old colours. Black cables look sketchy. Well, based on the colours being correct, because I don't know that off the top of my head, um, no code. Um, I, but there's possibly for C2, just a bit of um, heat dissipation from the transformer on the cables there. You know what I put this as uh, when I when I when I had a look at I, I put it as an FI. I wanted to know more. Mm. That was my first. In, 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 I, I, I need to understand this weird setup. Is this a proprietary product, or has this just been made ad hoc on site? But is your now is your lack of understanding of the colours a legitimate reason to put an FI to a client? Um, Based on you've priced this job, you've awarded this job, you know where you're going. Yeah, is but that remember, a so just remember, I, I am, and it's a good point. I am inspecting to the wine regulations. If I see something that I can't see fits within the scope of 7671 that has been built on site, then I would ask the client more questions. I'd look for further investigation. I may not have the time because I'm doing sampling. And this so is Daniel's, Daniel's dug into good. the regs. Control circuits, oh, ELV, you. and other applications, line conductors can be violet. They can be violet. This was this was actually feeding a hundred and ten volt socket at the end yeah. of a pit, which so, is what so that's so that's reduced low voltage. Yes, not extra low voltage. Yes. So does that classify? So for me, further investigation is. I know there's a problem. I don't know the reason for that problem. Mm -hmm. That is yeah, what I, I would use a fur. I wouldn't use a further investigation to say, I know there's a problem. Or I'm hang on, no, take it back. I wouldn't use further investigation to say I'm not sure if there's a problem. As an inspector, we should know there's a problem. 
this is the basis, but I'm not quite sure why that is. Could yeah. be an open ring circuit, could be, you know what I mean? There's lots of things mm. you go, I know that's not right. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't kind of know. delay on this kind of thing. It's just what it is to me. Mm. Um, it looks fine. Um, there's the red tape. Is that a polarity indication or just a bit of red tape? A bit of red tape. A bit of red tape, okay. So maybe definitely a polarity a indication one. would be good. Yeah, cool. it was definitely a weird one. It was kind of weird because the socket was actually down about four meters away to the right. It went into a bit of trunking and then came out and then went down. I mean, we're, it was just something that we didn't see that was the norm. It's something that obviously been mm. bespoke over time. Mm. Well, this kind of like we had earlier on, where we had the uh, the ELV with the other switch. This kind of splits the splits us up here. Mm. And we've got here, we've got forty six percent have gone C three. Yep. Thirty nine percent have gone FI. Yep. 7% have gone C2 and 4% have gone C1. And, and a lot like, of people just haven't worked or got to, to but use that's the, that. And that again takes us back to the start where the whole, when you're working on that industrial, that larger stuff and you're going outside of your comfort zone, you will see unique bespoke stuff that may not sit within the norms of LV distribution submain. And, and I thought I'd throw a few photos in to just stimulate, look, this is different. We may not have mm. seen it like this. Um, which again is is a good thing to debate because it's then sharpening that pencil of how do I understand that a little bit more? Yeah, um, and that's why I threw that in because that one threw me when I first saw that it threw me. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that kind of, but those are good because those are things that make you realise actually you know you have to stop a minute, reassess your understanding, you've got to mm -hmm. rejudge your competence. Things like that are good, and it's also the reason why you need to have access to a full suite of standards. Exactly. Because you will come across these sort of things and go, right, okay, I'm going to go away tonight and ruin my night trying to find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, right, let, yeah. let's, go into, let's go into another series now. So this is, this is one that um, is mind-blowing, okay? So, Neil, what you discussed earlier on about, so something's gone wrong and we've replaced it and you know it's only going to last five years. Okay. So here is the debut of the five-year installation. So this is an installation that was uh, put in which lasted five years. Um, just over actually about five and so a half. So is this is this a refit of what was there before? Um, no, this is a brand new installation, brand okay. spanking new installation, which lasted five years, um, which is mind blowing in itself. So as you can see here, you've got trunking, you've got some beautiful stainless uh, copex, which took all of the feeds um, out of the the plant area and up to the uh, distribution. You've then got the new armors all labelled up, so it's an it's a reasonably nice job. But you have this severe attack of corrosion across the installation. Now, there's more than one photo before we even start running this poll. Inside one of the boxes, the reason we were there, we found this burnt out cables. Okay, you see the nice, nice bit of labeling there and ferulin and all that good stuff. So some pride was put into it. It was a neat enough job. Um, but when we start yeah. touching the boxes, you can see they just fell apart from corrosion. See the glands, plastic, completely uncorroded, cabling, fine, no problem whatsoever. But each box, as you could see, just couldn't stand the test of time at all. Now, um, this was a five-year-old install. Um, that had burnt out and the persons who found the burnout were incredibly embarrassed over the fact it was five years and they did not want to tell the client I bet because they were responsible for the selection and erection of materials oh so the people who put it in yes and was it war in, under warranty and all that oh it was out of warranty it was it's only going to get 12 this is fundamentally warranty. a designer's issue isn't it? the design mm. made, made a poor selection and erection absolutely material this suitable is... for their intended use this is so unique. Is no, no. I don't think I've ever seen that before. So under that time frame. Oh, I've, I've seen some corrosion, but I've not seen this excess. No way. For, for me, if I come across this, it would be, it's definitely a C2, but I would go into more detail in my feedback to the client on this. Okay. So you really need to look at what you're specking. I know this is only five years old, but you know, we, we, we need to have a chat away from this report and you really need to look at how, the people you're, you're, who's giving you advice on this equipment because this should not be the case after five years. This was a cause of, the, one of the root causes of this was the cut and paste culture of industrial designing. Uh, I've always done it here. I've always done it this way. I've got a generic design that I can just whip out and keep fobbing off with the client. Um, I'm going to read out to you um, just before you code it. Um, 
uh, Appendix 5, AF2, the presence of corrosive or polluting substances of atmospheric origin is significant. Installations situated by the sea or near industrial zones producing serious atmospheric pollution, such as chemical works, cement works, this type of pollution um, arises, especially in the production of abrasive, insulating or conductive dusts. And it even talks about the nature of substances in accordance with satisfaction of the salt mist test, according to BSEN 6 0068 2 11. Um, I've read it. It's um, yeah, painful. But yeah, um, basically what the cause of that was, was um, uh, um, effervescence, um, a combination of effervescence, salt mist deposits um, from coastal areas and the fact it was in the middle of a heavy industrial area. But that was five years. That was, was, really was, was stainless the solution? Uh, stainless was the only solution there and everywhere that wasn't falling apart was stainless 316. It's the only thing you can do. There is actually a network rail standard that actually covers this as well. But hmm. Andy Foster um, said something interesting. Um, I'm going to disagree with him, but he says it has emergency lighting from the from the middle one there. You can see platform emergency lighting. Yep. So for him, it's a C1. Now that's not a C1 for me because something else has to happen before there's an issue. So this is an exact answer as we started off the webinar. In normal use, there's not going to be an emergency, so there's no problem. Um, something has to happen for the emergency lights to kick in, for the evacuation procedures to happen. That's the difference between a C1 and a C2 in my book. Yeah, yeah. Um, just, I just would, to be clear, look at I the would, labelling, emergency light. Hmm. I would say that... Um, <laughs> emergency lighting. <laughs> I would say this is, this is where it comes to the point we said at the beginning of this, where we, look at, we focus on BS7671, but we also need to think if there is emergency lighting that's not working, we need to have some some ability to reference 5266 and other standards that actually give ammunition to the argument of mercy lighting and the okay. integrity of it. So what I'll probably do, and I'll probably get a shot for it, but who cares? So this was actually a King George V station on the DLR, which is surrounded by houses and surrounded by heavy industrial plant. So imagine, imagine if that's the case, what else you can do by poorly selecting and erecting. And that station was five years old when this happened. Five years old. So it's yeah, it's poor. worth it's worth considering that's these sorts of things. Very, so, very poor design. So um what's everyone said? Eighty eight percent C two. Well done, eighty eight percent. Good on you. Sir. Uh, I would agree um, with that. Um it's fair play to everyone else. Yeah, it would um I would there would uh, again I would add extra um information about the importance of the emergency lighting and the, the need for it to not fail but doesn't mean it's immediately dangerous as, as neil says you do need to have the need for emergency lighting the annoying, the annoying you thing could, is for, you could for example that emergency lighting could be an area of a car park you could just shut down that car park for a period of time you know yeah, i mean this actually, still operate. Did, this actually did the platform lighting so from an operational disruption you're shutting a station which is costing mm -hmm. you tens of thousands of pounds an hour it's costing you a lot of money um but yeah, so um, that was, I thought it was a great example of external influences, poor design, a, and let's be honest about it, and a, a, you know I do asset management, it's the asset life. You're getting no value because the contractor doesn't want to use stainless. He wants to go galv because everyone in the sun doesn't like using stainless or they're not used to doing it. So you don't get the 20 year life, you don't get a five year life. And this is a well documented incident. So I, I agree with C2. Now we're going to go on to the last one because this is a short one tonight. Um, and I'm going to show you that image there. So what can everybody see on that image? Can you see that image clearly enough? 3.2 amps AC. 3.2 amps. So this is the bit where I say thank you very much, everybody, for kind of taking part and tuning in. And we're going to be doing more of these. And we're going to do in some on the DNOs. But I want to leave you with a final thought. And the final thought is this. So that's zoomed in on that picture. So everybody in the chat, if you can see... Um, what's going on there you can see the dno so there's a tns by the looks of it separate cpc coming along with the cable uh, even says it on the label tns supply um, you then have a three-phase intake please note the lack of fuses so that installation is completely isolated electrically and yet you still have 3.2 amps mm. on so that, the that earth. installation is not generating any leakage current no none and the reason I put it up there is because we are going to go into this in future webinars. 
Um, we're going to do one on coding of DNO intakes and how to identify them. And we're also going to look at this uh, neutral diverted current issue in a little bit more depth. This is one of the reasons why I've been banging on about uh, getting clamp meters and checking. If you want to prove if you have diverted neutral current, that is the test. If you only have one single source of supply, pull the fuses or get the main isolator switched off. If you have a main isolator and put your clamp meter on. If you have something, then you have energy being transferred into your installation. Um, you may not have much voltage behind it, but you still have energy. And when you have levels of energy that go exceedingly high, then you can you go into the realm of arc flash um, and there are hazards behind that. So that's really it really. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone. And if anyone's got any question, and Neil, thank you for giving up so much of your time. Uh, it's hopefully it's been slightly different in, a, a, in, in the driver's seat as well tonight. I hope I've done uh, Mr. Skern proud. Awesome. <laughs> You Does anyone have any questions in the question? Because this is the bit where we can now go back and talk through any questions or queries or anything like that. Uh, okay. Uh, Sean arrived. Oh, Sean. Great. Good. Well, let's start again. <laughs> um, yeah. CPC current, thermal effect, insulation, dam, Connor Stanley. Oh, indeed, indeed. Everyone two on the earth. By the way, I've got pictures far higher than that. Um, oh, God, foot, yeah. Pillar. New favourite test, clamp the installation dead. Indeed, it is a new favourite test. And I think, is it, is it fair, can we say this on him? Why not? We might as well. Um, mm -hmm. I, we believe from discussions with the DNO that the earth leakage clamp test is going to appear in Guidance Note 3 before it appears in a future edition of the regs. Yes. Um, which, yes, needs to happen. Because if yeah. you think about it, um, uh, chaps, this here, I'm going to be really sad. I know everyone can't see it. This is a PME. I've got a section of PME cable concentric cable here if you think about these new cables that we've got into buildings or the stuff that's in the streets or if you look at our instagram feed the only thing that we have that's actually reliable is the line conductor mm. into our installations the neutral and earths are combined the number of broken pens are going up year by year so we are going to need to reconsider how we do our earthing and bonding and, and how we look at these diverted neutral currents yeah, and again, this is something that has been a gradual observation and we've looked into it further and we've found more information backing it up and we've found, you know, other people looking into it. And I've, I've, I've actually just, I've actually found in standards like BS7909, which is written back in 2011, which says about, you know, TNS systems really not being TNS systems anymore and always being remedied or repaired to be PME systems. And, you know, only TNS, true TNS systems are the ones that are really on on site you know um public T, uh, tns systems are basically being tortured and so these neutral currents that we're seeing and um, we think about you know how much work we've been talking about pme outside installations ev all that worry about pme systems and what if our tns is are also potentially going to have the same characteristics so just, just, I'm just going to read out a note in the UK Power Networks manual. All LV distribution networks should be assumed to be PME when providing new supplies. Um, even if they were originally uh, constructed using single neutral and earth, PILC, um, mm -hmm. cabling, therefore all new installations should meet full PME requirements for egg potential bonding specified in 7671. The trouble is, is what they don't very much tell you um, is that the networks outside, every time they do a joint... Um, is effectively PME'd. And if you look in uh, Energy Networks Association recommendation G12, it openly states that you can have PME and TNS, but the fixed installation should be considered PME. But it's, we're not told yeah. that. I've got this bit here. This is a C.4.2 from BS7909, um, which is the temporary events. It says TNS for permanent systems. It says TNS was historically a common arrangement, is now rarely, if ever, used as a new distribution to consumers. Where existing TNS distributions have been extended or repaired, this work is typically carried out with concentric cables using a single conductor as the pen. Those parts of the distribution downstream of the repair or extension then have electrical characteristics that approach those of a PME distribution, but the consumers still see them to be TNS. My advice to any inspectors coming across this issue would be to best practice and now this is something that i'm going on the journey with now and i posted on linkedin a little while ago is that from that from what we will be doing now is asking the dno rather than assuming by looking at the cutout we will be picking up the phone spending 20 minutes and going please confirm what the um 
what your earthing arrangement is to this end pan number. And then um, and I'll be putting that. I'll, I'll, I would so there say is, there bit... is an inherent danger in that, Neil, and we'll we'll get on that in the next webinar because it's fair to say that I've experienced this recently where I had a cable blow at one of my stations in the street and it's a three phase TNS head and they jointed it with a concentric cable making it PME, but the, the jointers weren't educated sufficiently or didn't really apply their own company standards. If you then say, here's an MPAN number, what is it? Um, they may turn and say it's TNS, but the entire street is configured accordingly. You then go into, uh, not that I'm being really sad or anything, but- The thing is, section... I can't be held accountable for a DNO's cock up. No, but no. the problem is, the consumers and the end users are going to be held accountable for the DNO's mm. lack of maintenance. And this in will then doing fall an inspection, and transfer into the contractor. Agreed. But in terms of doing inspection, I can prove due diligence and said, look, oh, yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah, take yeah. what no. I saw as gospel. I spoke to the DNO. It's their equipment. That's what they've told me. Yeah, well, this yeah. is what's been happening over time. DNOs haven't been doing their thing. So we're now yeah. seeing the electricians are being asked to assess the condition of the distribution we're now doing that on the icrs what we're going to have soon obviously is the introduction of this clamp meter test to look at the potential currents that could be coming in and then we'll be switching our earthing systems to tt basically fixing the problem for them over time yeah we'll end up having our own our own earth electrode farm or an ra for every yeah. installation separate because remember something it's not just the earthing it's the neutral yeah if if you lose your earth you lose your neutral uh, which means then you potentially have a big problem so we are going to cover this in future webinars. It, it may not be next week. It may be a month or so down the line, but mm. we'll get there. We just wanted to kind of tease that premise, really, that we are looking hard at it, and I am reading every document under the sun on it. Um, right, what are the questions? Have we got any more questions before we finish this up? Always treat yeah. as PME for Connor. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I'm the same. Um, DNO don't think they always know. The DNO records are in a state. Mm. They're in an utter state, to be honest with you. Um, the trouble is with treating things as PME. If you're going to go down the streets of EV, um, if, if we stay on industrial external containers, loads of external containers and industrial uh, metals and containers, then we need to know. We can't just say we can't assume it's a PME and then force a load of work that may not be necessary. I think it's good practice that we really know what the earthing arrangement is. I don't think it's forcing because on an industrial... There's a difference between a code and C2, isn't it? It's no, no, a difference but, between but a no code an and C2. installation, Neil, what you're going to have is you're going to have a structure, structure that's bonded. Now, that structure, you could then consider the foundations of that structure, your own foundation earth electrodes, yeah, which could then be your own RA. It could be your own neutral earth reference point, which still well, would provide a reasonable level of protection for the installation. I'm going down the sort of steel containers, that sort of thing. Um, oh, yeah. But if yeah, it was yeah, a PME, yeah. I'll be looking at a C2. Um, yeah. if, 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 but if it's a, if it's a legitimate TNS, it's a no code. Mm. So it's a big difference there. The key thing is, 20, 30... the key thing is legitimate TNS. It's, it's a case of, I mean, right now, all we can do is this test that was just shown as a way to assess. If we get no trace of current whatsoever, then that's fairly good. Uh, confidence that there's 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 no problem. Mark Mark Holmes has nailed it, and in in G12 there is actually a reference that states about um, pilk cables can be effectively considered electrodes. So anyone who comes across a PME, uh, there's a lot of this on social media at the moment where they're mm. measuring more than 0.35. UK Power Networks. All you got to do is just Google. Um, Google it, um, and there's a data sheet for electricians. It's on our Instagram. They allow up to 0.8 now because yeah. they consider the pilk to be part of their electrode system. Now, I think it's also fair to say that the HSC and the DNOs are having lots of chats about their compliance with the electrical safety quality continuity rigs. Mm -hmm. Keeping it quite quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any other questions on coding and industrial? Yeah, I think we've kind of just... Uh directed the chat towards PME systems towards the end. Yeah, well, we'll do another webinar now. We've <laughs> yeah, got we a lot more work to do, but the good thing is we're all emerging our knowledge and we're all debating it and we're all giving various scenarios, which is great because mm. all that does is improve our own general knowledge and it, it, it drives that thirst and hunger mm. to want to learn more. Yeah, We've, We've just a next... question here from, yeah. from Richard quickly. He just says, what if the containers are classed as permanent fixture PME allowed? Containers can't be uh, classed as a permanent fixture. Things that class uh, permanent fixture would be permanent water supplies permanent electrical supplies them sort of things make it uh, a a a i mean they're transportable permanent. units aren't they um, yeah so i had so it, i had an installation a national trust building where we had a tt system and it was all commissioned and all signed off and the zs or the ze was fairly good 
but then two or three of the actual containers after the erection left. And it was those things that were connected to the actual boxes that pulled the ZE that were giving it its low impedance. And when those things were removed, all the earth just went up. Mm. And um, the thing is, Richard, what you've got to remember is the container doesn't know if it's temporary or fixed or permanent. And in got fairness, a clue. I've the actually seen, the same. I have seen containers sat on, on sites for 20 years used as offices connected yeah. to PME supply. Well, school, look, at, look at schools, schools, these modular offices, um, yeah. they're going up everywhere, you know, and um, yeah, the, the electrics, the electric feed, the, the, um, the danger, I, the PME in the ground doesn't know that it's a temporary or, or permanent. I think one of the things, there's evidently issues. I mean, if we do the research, there's evidently issues with the network with its age. I think one of the reasons why we're researching this and investigating it so much is because it's inevitable that the networks are palming off. And I'm going to say this brutally. We are, as consumers, being palmed off with the costs of everything infrastructure-wise that fails in this country. Now, what I'm worried about is good electricians who do the due diligence, who mitigate the risks that can occur, will end up suffering because we're going to end up having to put more and more technology and more and more products because the wiring regulations may change in the future to mitigate the network's failure. Uh, and this is why I'm, Paul Skirm said it brilliantly um, the other day. Every time there's a broken pen, million pound fine. Watch the networks change immediately. Now, I have actually spoken to the DNOs and when PME was introduced in the late 70s, there was a plan in 40 years time because that's the life of a, uh, uh, the original PME cable um, for all um, other services, gas and water, to be fully insulated. Well, that never happened because governments changed, um, yeah. which was the plan to reduce the risk of broken pens and exporting PME outside the equipotential zone. We are left with a mess that electricians are having to play catch up with. And, um, technology is, and technology is taking us away from us, like EVs, hot tubs, they're coming more and more common, which weren't the case 40 years ago. It is, <laughs> indeed. Really thought about 40 and years. the thing is, it's a huge distraction because we're now having, we're now basically hoping that technology will get rid of this other problem. You know, we Most see new, new technologies with EV, which are now being discussed, you know. Um, so we don't know. We don't know. What oh, yeah, yeah, EV. Yeah, yeah. Let's not. Let, time, we, time, no, that's it. Science yeah. times. Yeah, we could do it. Is it, do you know what? From a technical perspective, um, when and I've said this to a lot of the um, older electricians that I've met years ago, it was inductive or resistive loads. It was very simple principles of selection or action, understand the use, external influence, and all that. Now we have we're we're, we're in the era of mitigating network change, mitigating um, EMI EMC issues, mitigating diverted neutral currents, mitigating mutual compatibility within the fixed installation, the connected loads affecting the protection devices. All of this stuff we never had to think about makes this such an exciting time. Um, brain melting, but very exciting. Well, it's important. Don't be scared of it. Mm. Those are out there. Don't be scared of it. There's more resources now than there and we don't know everything. Been. We don't know everything and we won't profess to know everything. What we will do is we will try and poke, prod, and, and put stuff out there for open debate um, because nobody's an expert in everything and we don't profess to be, and that's really important. But um, other than that, if anybody's got any questions, um, yes, the lack of compliance does oh. all my piss. Agree, Daniel? <laughs> right. Next week, we've got a webinar on intakes. Yes. Correct? 17 hours so far. <laughs> now, we, we, we're not planning on going into this area of diverted neutral currents there, are we? No, we, no it's we... purely going to be coding of intakes and identification. So yeah. what I'm using is I'm using the Energy Networks Association guidance note where they stole John Ward's pictures um, yep. for, um, and we'll use that to help people identify the different types and age cool. of cutouts and all the rest of it and how we code. Can we code? What do we look at? And then hopefully the week after that, Dan will be ready with the fire alarms one, which will be very controversial. Um, the fire industry will hate him forever for it. Um, <laughs> we, might, we, might, we, we might tease towards the end back onto this diverted, but yeah, we'll have update on fire and then we'll probably have this because we've got again this this neutral current is something that is fairly fresh and we're getting yeah. more and more information and we're basically just trying to um to just coordinate all the information that we've got and divert, enhance our understanding of it before we can then bring it to you guys i predict a lot of fis next week <laughs> <laughs> and that's it really yeah uh, again neil thank you for coming in buddy um, yeah cheers neil great help thanks, thanks for everyone much. taking part it's really, really been a pleasure um and thank you everyone for watching and taking part indeed and on youtube um please don't hate us it's far more enjoyable when you're doing this live wednesdays at seven yeah 
yeah um if you you know and again it, we, we go through we go through a series of these and if there's more interest in talking in getting together and talk then we can either do some of these again or we can even do some like um open meetings and stuff we just want to use this platform as much as we can to get engaged in talking all right any any other words for you guys before i press the end button any other things to That's say from me all right no. cheers now we'll leave it for another webinar let's let's oh, do some more no. controversy than the next week's one <laughs> take care bye-bye yeah. cheers Thanks, guys everybody. See bye-bye